when i started seeing patients uh, it was a totally different story because they did not have even 2 uh, rupees to spend for a painkiller or a fever medicine even not not even 2 rupees what do you think uh, can be added to the medical education system today patient communication and patient skills because a lot of violence against doctors that happens in the country now is because of miscommunication so much of death i used to see in the icus when i was posted there it was just overwhelming this is a serious practice you you are you are actually putting everything on them so this uh, entire generation of uh, diet came up because people suddenly started seeking shortcuts it's about how you restrict your calories and increase your physical activity yeah. so there are a lot of people who don't follow any of these diets and they still come with weight loss what is quackery and what is pseudo science if you go and read the ayurvedic text i mean i have done this i have a, i have all the textbooks in my room if you go and read that you will be more confused actually because there are so many things overlapping in vata pitta kapha characteristics that they have given it is impossible for you to actually identify all of that in a person clinical medicine has to go hand in hand with the research i remember reading somewhere that uh, a typical doctor usually uh, lives 10 years less than an average person is that right as a doctor it is important that you stick by the rules but also you should bend the rules towards benefit of your patients the executive health checkups i think this is one of the most wasteful thing that the hospitals offer people where they'll even uh, let you do an mri just for the fun of yeah. it right i mean why hi welcome to the other side i'm your host dilip an entrepreneur and an endurance athlete in this podcast we will explore the experiences of high performing individuals while unpacking their mental and physical fitness routines that took them to where they are Today's conversation is a special one. I'm going to talk to Dr. AB Phillips, also known as the Liver Doc on Twitter. Dr. AB is a specialist in hepatology and liver transplant. He did his MBBS, MD, and DM, and is the president's gold medal winner for academic excellence. He has 200 plus research papers published to him. But there is an interesting other side to him. He is a crusader against all sort of quackery and misinformation on health and pseudoscience. He is a father of three, an avid gamer, and a graphic novel enthusiast. His Instagram page is a refreshing contrast to his Twitter presence. Let's get into the podcast. You took the time to travel all the way from um, Kochi. I uh, really appreciate the time you've uh, taken. I'm uh, very excited to unpack a lot. Your other side, your work. Uh, the work you do outside your medical profession and your personal side. So I'm excited to talk to you today. Yeah, I and mean, thank you for uh, having me on this podcast, uh, Dilip. I mean, it's a pleasure being here. I mean, especially when um, I did my uh, bachelor's in medicine in Bangalore at St. John's, and I left Bangalore in 2007. So it's been, I think, 16 years since I have not been to Bangalore. So this is this is a very memorable visit for me. Excellent. So, uh, you know, what I was thinking is, uh, there's a lot to unpack about you. Uh, you are uh, off the camera. We were talking. You're famous and infamous, right? So we have to get into the trenches of both. Um, but I'm very curious about three parts. One is um, uh, who you are uh, outside of what people know. Uh, the work, what you do, more as a science communicator, right? Uh, and then. uh debunking certain faqs because i posted and i'm sure a lot of people had a certain faqs which i'm sure you would have a yeah. you know specific answer so uh your choice whether you want to get into the depth or not but we'll try to break it into three segments i want to begin uh with kind of when i was trying to know about you uh what surprised me is you're someone who aspired to be a screenwriter uh you wanted to be a graphic uh novelist yeah um you are avid gamer yeah you will like your food your food explorer mm-hmm. you like photography from there to win a uh, president's uh, award for academic excellence in hepatology um take me through your journey uh what was that transformation uh before who you are today known as a known as liver doctor so before that what was that journey yeah i mean lot to unpack here itself i think sure. just the first question um so ba- ba- i was born in a place called kottayam small town in kerala and uh, my dad is a very senior gastroenterologist i mean i think i mean he is one of the senior most uh, gastroenterology specialist in the country 
I mean, I would call him one of the as one of the founding great grandfathers of gastroenterology in the country. So um, I was all the time exposed to the medical field from my childhood. So I used to stay in Kottayam, and in 1992 we moved to Kochi because my dad got a better prospect there, and he started working at this place called PBS Hospital. So I did my schooling at Kochi. I mean, from fourth grade to the twelfth at Chinmaya Vidyalaya. Where I still remember, I we used to we had to study the Gita and the Sanskrit and and it was it it was wonderful at that time. And during my school days, it was I mean at that time we had two options, right? So either you become a doctor or you become an engineer. So uh, I have a elder brother, an elder sister, and a younger sister. That's four of us. My brother took the engineering part because he's the elder guy. He gets to choose first, so he took the engineering uh, position. So I, that leaves me with uh, the only guy who has to become the doctor, okay. right? So uh, initially I did not want that uh, because I used to love reading. I love the comic and graphic novel format. I mean, this was since when I was a child. Tintin, Asterix and Obelix, you know, stuff like that was fascinating for me. And uh, I wanted to do something like that, you know, write books and you know, get into media, become a screenwriter and things like that. But that's not how the way things work out. So ultimately, when I finished my uh, MB, my uh, schooling, my 12th grade in Chinmaya, uh, we, have, we were a bunch of kids uh, who were deciding on what to do next, right? So uh, at that time, we had uh, one option only, right? There is this this person called P.C. Thomas. He's very famous there in Kerala yeah. because that was a... Now you have a lot of coaching centers, you know, Alan and this and that. Yeah. But at that time, we just had this one guy. And uh, you go to P.C. Thomas or you don't go. If you go to P.C. Thomas, your future is set. If you don't go, you guys are like lost cattle. That's like quota of engineering. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, I was sent to P.C. Thomas. So we had this Sunday batch where while we are finishing 11th and 12th grade, we uh, take a train to Trishur. This, this was at Trishur. We take a train to Trishur Sunday morning, uh, get the classes done till evening and then get back to Kochi by, via train or bus. And we, we, we were a bunch of kids who used to do that. And uh, once we are coaching this was like a two year program and once this was done um, and we gave the we gave we gave all those exams at that time it was not neat or next and all that we had this ai pgt you yeah. know i mean getting into all india yeah. uh, entrance exams and uh, we all gave it and we waited for our results and uh, everyone except me got in you know that, that was like a reality uh, strike you know like they actually studied for it you know i was just like you know go attend classes mcq school you just mark the, the dictum at that time was, I mean, the rule was that if you did not know the answer, always mark B. Because that most of the time, it, that is going to be the right answer. So I marked order I knew and everything else I marked B. And possibly I got more negatives and then I did not get through. So then everybody has now an option to get into a medical college or an engineering college. And I was the guy stuck at home, right? So that was like one of the worst days of my life. Because you don't know what to, I mean, you are not doing the thing that you want to do. And you are not able to do the stuff that you are, you know, you are wanted to do. And then what I did was to join PC Thomas again as a full term, uh, you know, student there. So I studied for about a year, staying at the hostel. Again, deep, dark days, which I don't want to uh, go on about. But those were like really tough days. But then it, it gave me discipline in life. You know, the, there was, that is the time when I, when we, I mean, I understood that there is a time for play and there's a time for work. And when it's time to work, you have to work. You know, there is no uh, two things about it. So I studied there and I again gave those exams. And I actually lost uh, a couple of years before I got into my bachelor's degree. So I got into MBBS after losing two years. And then I got into, I mean, I got I got through the All India Quarter also. And I got through St. John's separate exam. And I choose St. John's because it's Bangalore, very close. I can travel home whenever I want to. And at that time, we had these uh, uh, semi-sleeper buses that take us overnight to Kochi. And I... Completed my uh, bachelor's in medicine from Bangalore in St. John's. So even then, I was quite confused about you know what's happening because people think that after MBBS, that's it, you're a doctor and you're good to go. Exactly the opposite because all the confusions that you have before joining uh, medicine, it becomes uh, you know it becomes like ten times more than that once you finish your MBBS because you're a doctor but you are neither here nor there mm. because you don't have the confidence to treat anybody. You know, you can give an advice on a paracetamol or, you know, some steam inhalation, stuff like that. But beyond that, you can't, you can't prescribe anything. Your hands will uh, shiver, it will tremble. 
And uh, once you get out of MBBS, your family, I mean, your extended family, uh, cousins, and they all think that, you know, you guys can, I mean, we can actually handle everything. So they'll come with reports and stuff like that, show you the ultrasound. And I was very, very uncomfortable with all that. So then it was time to do the, take the next step. So meanwhile, all my other original ideas are all going down the drain because I, because now it's, it's become a rat race. You have, you're in this, now you have to win it or at least complete it. And uh, then comes uh, the whole aspect that, you know, my dad's been practicing as a super specialist for a long time, I mean, like for decades. So, uh, I mean, from what I saw from him is was that you have to focus. You, know, you can't be a generalist um, medical practitioner because it, it doesn't, you're, you're stuck in a place. It doesn't take you anywhere unless and until you can focus on uh, your patients well. So it's time to do specialty. So then I, I, I have no idea. I mean, I, 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 I sweat at the idea of becoming a surgeon because I can't stand the sight of blood and I don't want to, I mean, cut people open. I mean, it's, it's not in my uh, character, but I'm sure it's, I mean, I mean, I'm not saying surgeons are bad, but excellent and they are needed very much, but it's, it's not cut out for me. So uh, I decided it's medicine is the way to go and internal medicine, general medicine is the next step because only if you do that general medicine, you have an option of branching out. So you have these uh, dead end subjects where if you take ophthalmology, you don't have to do much. You are stuck. You 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 can end with an MS and then you can start practicing, focus on your area of interest. Or if you take dermatology, you are a skin specialist and you are done. It's it's an MD degree and done. There is no DM in dermatology. But then you are again stuck there. Will will you be successful? These questions come. So since my dad was a gastroenterologist, of I mean uh, unofficially I was also the gastroenterologist, right? So then I sat again to prepare for uh, the postgraduate exams, that is the MD exams. Again, it was Trishur because that was the place where they did the best coaching for postgraduate. So Trishur was like uh, the Boston of the East where all your, uh, you know, major academic centers are there and people come and learn there. But this is, you're not going back to P.C. Thomas again? No, so P.C. Right. Thomas does the MBBS part. Okay. The MD degree uh, training was done by the Trishur Medical College alumni. Oh, okay. So that was like hot at that time and a lot of people used to go there so then I started going there and I, I spent uh, I mean I shared a room with one of my colleagues from St. John's and we studied together for about a year there and then both of us gave exams and he got into radiology in Toronto Medical College and I got MD General Medicine in Calcutta in Kolkata uh, that is uh, in Nirlathan Sarkar Medical College uh, at Sialda. Uh, at that time I did not know uh, what to take because I was getting some college in Kerala also, I was getting some colleges in the north, I was getting in central India. Again, my dad comes into the picture because he is, I mean, I, he is very wise. You know, he talks very less, but when he talks, he talks what is required. So he tells me, take Calcutta because that is going to improve your clinical skills because that is the place where you'll see a lot of patients from a different, different categories and different kinds of diseases. And he was actually very true about it. So I started, so again after losing another one and a half years, I got into my MD. What I'm trying to say is that I was a very, very average student. And I would, I would not even call myself as an average student. I would actually call myself as a below average student because I struggled through MBBS, passed it somehow. The only um, subject that I really loved during my bachelor's was forensic medicine because it was really investigative kind and I loved it. But you don't get to do anything much in forensic medicine. So my parents were not very keen on me taking forensic medicine because you're stuck with police work and things like that. You don't, you don't super specialize and see patients. You're dealing with dead, dead people. And uh, because I loved it, forensic medicine. And, and that's the only subject where I got honors in. Uh, rest of everything I just scraped through. So, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, coming to this point that, you know, I, I actually struggled through all of these exams to get through it each, each, uh, place. It was, it's not like, uh, it was easy for me. It was very difficult. And once I got into MD in Calcutta, uh, I think life took a complete uh, 360 degree turn there. Because that is where I figured out that, you know, it's not about just patients and doctors treating patients in the outpatient or looking after them in the inpatient. It was much more than that because I came, see, I'm, I'm, I'm from an okay, well-to-do family. My dad was from a very poor background, but he made uh, what he has now all by himself. And he's given us the comfort. So I'm privileged that way. But all that just crashed the moment I started my uh, studies in uh, Calcutta. Because there, is a, there was a, it was the first time where I had to actually share 
I mean, in, in, in St. John's also, the hostel was pretty good. It was nice. It, it was I mean, from the first year onwards, we had our own single rooms, right? So you are, you have a private place, your own place. It's, it was very nice. But here, it was the first time I shared a hostel room with four, four other guys and they're all seniors. They never, they can't speak, uh, proper Hindi or uh, they never spoke to me in, in English. Uh, it was all Bengali. So the moment I entered, they just keep talking to me in Bengali and I have no idea about Bengali, right? And it's like the French. You talk to them in any language, they'll talk back to you in yeah. French only. So it's, these guys are like that. I mean, and um, the first day, uh, I had to deal with rats on my bed. The second day, I figured out that, you know, there is this, the, the, the I, I learned how to use an Indian toilet for a few weeks. It took me a long time. And I, I'm, I'm saying this because I don't see it as something that people should not be doing. I'm, I'm saying it because everybody should know that there are different levels in life and we should be open to all of this, yeah. right? It, it's not like you are sitting there and there are problems beneath you and you are, uh, you are completely blind to it. It's there. Just because you don't feel it doesn't mean that it is not there. Yeah. It is still there. So I went through all of that and I felt really, uh, bad for myself because I never had uh, that kind of an experience before and I, I knew that there were people experiencing that so I, I, I started uh, I mean started slow and steady during my bachelor's there and when I started seeing patients uh, it was a totally different story because they did not have even two rupees to spend for a painkiller or a fever medicine even not not even two rupees some of them used to just stand outside get the free registration and they would expect us to give them some samples from our uh, desks and drawers, which by the evening, a lot of these medical representatives used to come and give us samples and go. So they were waiting for those samples. They did not even have money to buy simple pain medications. In the hospital, uh, in the IP, in the inpatient, when I used to see patients with snake bites and patients with uncontrolled diabetes, uh, these people work hard in the fields. They get bitten by snake. Some of them don't even come to us because they don't have any means of transportation or money to get to the hospital. They die at home or they go to a, a traditional healer nearby who would do a lot of stuff on them and then they, they won't make it. And uh, some of them who do come to us come in such a bad shape. We can't do anything for them. Uh, they cannot afford anything additional because if, if you want to give some medicines that is out of what is stocked in the hospital, these people will have to go and buy it from a pharma, pharma uh, I mean, from a pharmaceutical outside the hospital. They did not have money for that. And I could see that people are just dying without insulin. They could not afford insulin. The hospital runs out of insulin at some point. And all these people who are supposed to have the right to health uh, in a place which was built for them to protect them, they were dying inside it. So imagine dying inside your own sanctuary. No. It's, it's crazy. That is what real clinical medicine was. So what we had to do was that without any resources, Keep them protected and alive inside that sanctuary. How do you do that? It's crazy. It's insane. So what we used to do was, see, I was a very, I mean, I think this aspect we will talk at some point or maybe not at all, but I was a very religious person at that point. And I used to uh, pray a lot for my patients and, uh, you know, push in whatever I, I could do, whatever I could do for them at that time, or maybe not the best of my abilities because I thought it was 50% me and 50% God, right? So I did my part. So this is all I can do. Now you do your part kind of a stuff, right? So I used to do that for them. But, and, and I used to see that these patients, some of them did make it, some of them did not. And uh, when people used to come with something known as diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a very, very uh, disastrous complication of uncontrolled diabetes, you have to hydrate them, give them insulin, otherwise they are going to die of infections. And uh, what we used to do is we just, at some point we had to only, we could only hydrate them and we did not have insulin. And we should, we, and if somebody had insulin on the side, we, we would borrow that from that patient and give it to them. So we used to do a lot of that stuff. We used to go to other wards, collect medicines from there. We used to do a lot of things there. I mean, I am very proud uh, because that is where I learned the importance of humanism. Right. So by the time I finished my MD course, I saw that what I was doing for my patients in the first year, we have three years. And the, what I was doing for my patients in the second year and what I was doing for my patients in the third year. So if it was 50-50, me and God in first year, it was 75 and 25 in the second year and it was 100% and 0% in the third year. So I figured out that you're on the ground, you're here, 
you are the real person these are the real patients no there is no imagination happening here right you do whatever it takes so that is where i slowly started moving away from things that were not explainable by science and humanism and that aspect of doing everything for your fellow humans became an important part once i finished my masters degree in general medicine from calcutta and that i took over to my next uh, uh, i mean my next stage in life which was like you know you have to go for super specialty right so i finished my md in after all that and i came back home and i i worked for a little bit with my dad uh, as an executive uh, health checking i mean it's nothing much people do a lot of tests and you just have to interpret it for them it's simple work because he wanted me to study more on that because he i mean i was going to be the gastroenterologist right so ultimately um, what happened was that i gave my exams for dm entrance again like this all india level i did not get through so i lost an year again so my dad was like uh, so no there is this place where you have to go and see how it feels like so he tells me there is gb pan hospital in delhi yeah where uh, professor shiv sarin is there uh, he was a he's a big man and a great name in clinical research and he's a gastroenterologist but his focus is on hepatology on liver diseases so he said go there uh, be with him for a while and uh, see what you feel about it you know so he was completely into basic science work and clinical research at that time which i had no idea about like what i do now clinical research and basic science work and statistics i mean i was like a baby at that time i have never heard of some words in statistics also at that time so he said you go there and be with him for a while so after my uh, masters uh, he sent me i mean just during that time he sent me and i uh, started my uh, studies i mean my exposure with professor sari and uh, he said that you know the i mean there was no clinical medicine there when i joined right so i was like a junior research fellow in basic science the laboratory lab lab there and um, what happened was that i was not seeing any patients there is no humanistic side to anything it was just lab work and cell work and tissue work and all that and i was just getting completely choked and i wanted to take the next step so meanwhile uh, i quit that place okay. and uh, professor sarin told me you know you are quitting but you will realize that this is also a very important aspect of clinical practice because a clinician should be a scientist if you are a clinician scientist that is where i got that from if you are a clinician scientist only then you are a whole true doctor for your patient otherwise you are not so i just listened to that and i just you know ran out from there and uh, i started preparing again and i did not get through again so my dad said see gastroenterology is now so by that time my dad had some ideas in his mind and he said gastroenterology is now going to become a saturated practice right so there are so many seats so many gastroenterologists are passing out day every day uh, it's becoming more of skill because you do this kind of endoscopy then there is advanced endoscopy there is ercp there is third space endoscopy so would you, would you want that kind of a skill based practice or do you want a practice where you can actually apply a lot of thought and skill uh, for your patients so i said that i don't know so he said though so now there is something known as hepatology which is now a sub branch of gastroenterology and again professor sarin was now starting a new institute under the government's help uh, in delhi which was institute of liver and biliary science at wasant kunj so he said now you please go and uh, be there and see what clinical hepatology so i went and joined back uh, with professor sarin as a clinical uh, as a non academic senior resident there uh, in wasant kunj in ilbs and that was so different from what i was because okay. i saw the basic science part initially and i had the clinical part from calcutta what i saw there was a marriage between both so you had a clinical research coming in with a lot of basic science input for your patient so there were that was like a very high end referral uh, government setup so they had the toughest the most difficult to manage patients coming in so much of death i used to see in the icus when i was posted there it was just overwhelming i still remember people used to come in i mean al- most of the time it was alcohol users um, they used to come in vomit like 4 liters of blood collapse get on a ventilator and die within an hour you know you have no time to even do anything for them such crazy kind of seriously ill patients those this is this is a serious practice you you are you are actually putting everything on them and for such people they had a separate uh, approach altogether so there was a lot of protocols running based on clinical research and basic science inputs for people 
who did not have anything from standard of care. So they, they were running this parallelly along with your conservative care. And that was so, so impressive because a lot of new things were being identified there. They were publishing it. Uh, they were talking about it. It was all on an international stage. So different kind of uh, medical practice there. So I, I did uh, eight months of my uh, specialty training there in the sense that to get a, a hang of it, that was, that was a non-academic position. And then I, I said that, you know what, I'm going to give my entrance exams again. So it was time, it was almost a year now. So this was my third attempt. And I gave ILBS exam. And I gave all Indian Institute of Medical Sciences because I had to give because it was a prestige issue <laughs> for me. Everybody else was giving, so I gave it because, because I'm sure I was not going to get through that. It requires a different kind of preparation. And I got through in ILBS for the interview after the written exam. And the interview, it was easy for me because I knew exactly how the patients were being treated as per protocol. So it was, I got through easily uh, as a second person. I mean, there were three seats at that time and I got in as a second person. And I started my DM uh, super specialty training in ILBS and that was life changing because that is when I understood that clinical medicine has to go hand in hand with research. And only then you can actually become a complete doctor because you remain updated for your patients. So remaining updated for your patients is not just for you. Remaining updated is not just for you. It is actually for your patients. So somebody who's been practicing directly right after their training, if they are not in an academic setup or in an academic mind, they are actually losing out and the patients are losing out. So that part I, I completely embraced when I was in uh, ILBS. And by the time I completed my DM, so when I started off as a very confused kid to somebody who understood that uh, human, humanistic approach to problems is very important to somebody who understood that, you know, it's not just, about, not just about being humanistic, it's also about being critically thinking. And these three things made me aware that what I'm doing right now, even though I, I, I have no regrets at all by not becoming a screenwriter or anything, because I have grown and developed myself in a way that I find myself useful for other people. I mean, this is something very important. You should have some self-esteem, right? You should know that, I mean, people might call it arrogance or they might call it, uh, you know, boastful character or uh, they might call you, uh, you know, selfish. I mean, name it whatever you want. But I think if you have, if you love yourself, you have some self-esteem about the things that you do, that actually improves your uh, output about things that you can do for others. So I gathered all of that through these years. So it's not like three, four years. So that's MBBS, six years. Um, three years of MD and three years of uh, DM medicine and a couple of years each lost in between. So that's like 16 to 17 years of my life just studying only to come on Twitter for a chartered account to tell me that I'm wrong, <laughs> you know. So, uh, so this is, this is how that, 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 that has happened. So the whole development and evolution about what I have, I was and what I am now. Uh, which is actually a clinical hepatologist. So I do, uh, uh, I, I work from Monday to Friday. Uh, contrary to what a lot of people on Twitter say is that I have a lot of time. So I'm sitting with my phone looking at the next message. That, that, that does not happen. So I work from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day, sometimes up to 7 p.m. depending on my referral loads. And uh, I work from Monday to Friday. Weekends I am free. Um, my work is my first priority. Seeing patients in the outpatient and inpatient is my first priority. Uh, Twitter comes very, very, very below the you know, priority list. Then I, uh, the, uh, I uh, do a lot of uh, clinical research. I teach. So I, we have DNB programs where I teach students. Uh, I'm also a clinical advisor to a central institute in Trivandrum. Uh, I'm also an advisor to the government of Kerala on microbiome studies. So I do all of that every day. And then I come on Twitter. <laughs> right. No, um, so Dr. Abhi, this is um, too much for me to digest because um, all this while, um, I was kind of thinking while you speak, this is this itself is not short of a very ideal um, uh, script for a possible movie. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you would ever be willing to uh, license this out. I, I know you've got a book deal though, but uh, um, very fascinating. And while, while you were talking, there were a lot of threads in my mind, but something which really stood out for me was um, the role perhaps your dad played. Uh, and what I wanted to understand was that, so uh, not really going in the trenches of parenting per se, but um, uh, those days of parenting was very different from what 
Our our current generation of parents are. Yes. You are a parent. I am a parent, and I'm sure a lot of listeners would be also identify themselves as a parent right now. Um, do you think that time the role your dad played was in itself a huge architect to who you became today? Was that relationship, in a sense, you going seeking advice and he responding, or was he proactive, uh, where he has a certain lens to what he thinks who is good or bad for you? Uh, what was that relationship like? So this was always being proactive. So I I never had to go and ask my dad what to do next. So he used to come and tell me uh, what would the ideal situation be, right? So. he was the kind of person who would say that you uh, who would not say that you know you have to do this so he'll give me options so this is this is what is happening and these are the options for you uh, what he would he feels is a good option he would definitely voice that and i would just have to think about it and then go that way so i had the option of doing becoming a gastroenterologist right i had the option of stopping at general medicine and working as a generalist i had the option of stopping at mbbs taking a masters in hospital administration and going into something that is completely non academic living a good life i mean i had all those options and i was i was also let to choose any of those options but i did not because the advices were very it was it, even though it was a lot of advices that my dad gave me but there are certain parts of it which were very logical and that is how i uh, moved through that phase so he, he was never imposing and if i told him that one day that you know i i don't want to do gastroenterology i just wanted to be a generalist i i want to practice general medicine only i'm sure he would have just agreed to it i mean he's that kind of a person so that way i think uh uh that aspect has is completely lost now because when i look at my children i'm just waiting on it you know i was about to ask you that how yeah. are you with your children so i'm just waiting on it so the the uh, last month i mean my uh, my daughter she is the eldest i have two daughters and a boy uh, eldest daughter is going to be 10 uh, the second daughter is 6 and my uh, son he's the youngest he is now 4 uh, he's uh, he's now 5 he's now gotten into uh, low kindergarten so my eldest daughter i mean she sees me on uh, youtube and i mean they have that youtube thing going on right so he she sees my photo on youtube or some thumbnail on youtube with me and all and she knows that i am a doctor i go to work and you know i help patients and i help people she she is very curious so she tells me that you know she wants to become a pediatrician i mean she's just going she's just 10 and i look at her and i look at the way medicine is now in india or i mean look at anywhere it's so competitive it's not that easy and i don't want to tell her that you know don't become a pediatrician do something else i want to tell him tell her that right so but that is like a negative approach to a, a career but so i'm just sitting on it so i'm 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 sitting on it because i know kids now can figure it out for themselves not like when i was there so at that time um, i mean there was no option where i can go and do a major degree in uh, you know graphic novel writing or i mean those were like your like dreams but now you have so many opportunities uh for people for for children to take up as a career so my elder sister she's an artist she's a minimalistic artist uh, she does a lot of uh, what do you call as installation art she has her own studio and she uh, works with a lot of local and national and international level artists and one of her uh, arts were actually was actually selected for uh, to be sent to the moon by a moon space program and she did all that she's in, she's in los angeles she's she's not here and my younger sister she is a violinist and she used to play the second violin for the uh, german philharmonic and uh, she also is a pianist she used to go for she goes for a lot of these concerts and she she was with ar rahman at one point in his orchestra and uh, now she is completing her phd in musicology and going to become a a music teacher and uh, you know going into the aspect of conducting uh music sessions and uh, you know concerts and things like that so she's so if you look at from at that point my dad was ready to send them in that lane at that time uh because he knew that this is what interests them so same way i want to know what my children are interested in i don't want to put in interest into them uh i i only thing i did i was regretting in my child was i did not learn how to play the guitar right so i was taught to play the tabla 
it's a good instrument i have nothing against people who play tabla but it was the most boring thing i have done in my entire <laughs> life to play the tabla and it did not take me anywhere you know you are opening a new channel of troll for yourself <laughs> by just saying that <laughs> you know, i mean that's why i'm 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 also uh, saying the good part <laughs> yeah yeah so i mean i i mean i just i mean i wanted to play the guitar all my life but i, I mean i still can learn but still so my um, uh, daughter she say she has chosen to play the drums which i think it's really really kick ass uh, because i it's 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 very rare for females to be drummers and it's really cool so i'm happy with her choice i'm not going to tell her no no you should please try to learn the violin which is much more feministic for you drums are not good for you no i'm not going to say that she wants to learn the drums she can play the drums similarly with the career part now she is saying she wants to be a pediatrician maybe 5 years down the line she'll say something else and at some point she will settle on whatever she wants and i will definitely uh, you know i mean help her see that through um, but i would definitely give her the advice that i feel she could or my my children could weigh in also in their whole aspect of deciding upon what they want to become it was not like before i mean when i was there it was engineer doctor and yeah. so many things in between which people were not uh, used to but now it is not like that people can do things that they love because yeah. i think work satisfaction is the most important aspect in life yeah even though i wanted to become a, a screenwriter and whatever i'm a doctor now and i'm loving it so i i love my work i love helping people because i have learned it through an evolutionary process that i that, that was part of my education and and every child i think will go through that and i think it's important that you balance it out but also tell them that from your point of view what they need to weigh in so that they don't land up with yeah. something that they are not happy with yeah uh, no so you know interesting so when you know another aspect while you were talking about your background what caught me attention was that uh, it's not that although in your admission you said you come from a certain degree of privileged background your dad has such a huge credential in the medical field you've also gone through multiple failures uh, uh entrance not getting through entrance exams uh probably also putting yourself into situations where you're not prepared because you came from a comfort zone right uh did you cross yourself into situations where you were depressed or did you experience depression uh was that something which uh, you had to kind of uh, experience first time that you were depressed or someone told you this is a situation you were figured out so was that a fabric on those days when you were trying to figure out th- something that something you had to get through i think depression is my best friend it it was there before it's it it's it's there still there even now yeah so in certain situations uh you are depressed for longer periods in certain situations you cope with depression and get over it so right now in my life i am not depressed all the time but there are situations where i get depressed it is mostly to do with work very little to do with family life but i know how to get over it right i i have a coping mechanism now now how was it earlier so earlier for example uh, when all my friends got through the entrance exam and i was a failure because indirectly people told me i was a failure right because you know see all you guys went to the same place you studied for the same time those guys got and you did not that means you are a failure right So I then I went and joined PC Thomas in in the hostel. I cried myself to sleep the first three weeks, every night. And I'm not talking about just shedding tears. I'm talking about really crying myself to sleep. And the interesting aspect was that we were three people in the room uh, during this is my bachelor's preparation, right, in Thrissur. Uh, I was there. Uh, a guy by the name Sai Krishna was there, and a guy uh, by the name Faizi was there. So I was a Christian. He was a Hindu, and he was a Muslim. and the three of us we bonded so well and they knew that i was depressed i knew they were also not very happy because all of us were repeaters no we called them as repeat batch yeah. right so we were all repeaters and like me they were completely lost at what they wanted to do and ultimately faizi got through in uh, in medicine uh, i think he got through in uh, general medicine and then he went on to uh, i mean he got through uh, in orthopedics and uh, sai krishna i don't know what he is doing now but uh, he got through in engineering in in kerala itself and uh, at that time 
the way I used to cope with that was that we had company. Like we had a single uh, aim. Uh, we all used to study together. And there was nothing between us that, that, uh, that differentiated us, right? Because we were all there for one reason. And that helped me. So I, d- I did not have to take uh, medications to get help me get through to it. Uh, at some point, I was so depressed that when I went home after a few months, I was so skinny because I was not eating anything because that is one thing that depression does to me. So depress- depressed people can either eat too much or they may not eat at all. So I was the other category. I did not, I did not want food. You know, I just wanted things to get, get over somehow. And my mother saw me and she was like, you know, this is not the guy I sent for uh, the studies. And I came back so skinny. And whenever my brother, I mean, at that time he was studying at, I mean, in, in a college. And when my, my brother used to visit and my sisters, they used to visit, they, they used to come and see me over the weekends in Trishur, which was very nice because I was, and they used to buy me this, what we call as Sharjah shake. I'm not sure if. Yeah. 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 yeah it's fantastic. It's even though. The, must, must, must. Yeah. Too dry. E- e- even though Ayurveds won't allow it to mil- to mix milk and bananas together. Yeah, sure, yeah. I think it's a kick-ass shake <laughs> with a little bit of malt in it. Yeah. And they used to buy me that. And so these memories, they, they actually helped me at that time. When I started my studies, uh, when I joined in bachelor's and then master's and then my super specialty, there were days where I used to feel that I was not useful. You know, I was not up to the mark that other people want me to be. So that was when I used to have very low self-esteem about myself. So I'm studying all of this and I was still seeing so many people dying. You know, you are just saying, uh, sitting there, treating them, they're still dying. And there's nothing you can do about it. And you have somehow figured out that, you know, 50-50 is now 100% and 0% and uh, you have no help left, right? And at that time, you feel useless. So the whole aspect of being lonely uh, from the first depression that struck me, that is from my preparation time. Now, it was not about loneliness. It is about being worthy of whatever you're doing. So that loneliness is now gone because you, you are surrounded by your colleagues and everybody. And they're all doing the same stuff they're doing there for patients. But then that loneliness now has become something developed into another form of depression, which is worthiness. So you're doing this, you're studying, I mean, are you good enough? So that kind of depression struck me all the while I was preparing or all the while I was uh, doing my degree uh, training in MD and DM. And I found out that uh, the whole aspect of uh, challenging depression or challenging your bad days versus your good days is to understand that on a bad day, you have given your best. Right. So, for example, I mean, 10 patients come to me in a critical state and 10 of them are going to die. And if two of them survive, that's because you did your best for them that day. Right. So that that kind of an attitude towards being under the cloud has helped me. So that is how I I take care of uh, being uh, on the uh, receiving end of depression to being on the other end of it. And I, I think everybody goes through this. I think every, if, if, if you look at, I mean, you, you interview about 100 doctors about their work and depression. I'm, I'm, I'm sure 95 of them will tell you that they're depressed. They may not require medica- medications to combat, but I'm sure there are a lot of doctors who even do that because I used to be on antidepressants uh, during the time when COVID hit. Uh, because that was a time when we never used to, we could not go to the hospital and all the patients that you were seeing were COVID and they were just dying. And there was, it was such a mess. It was chaotic. And your whole life was totally taken apart because uh, just before COVID hit, my family, my, my wife comes from Trivandrum. So she took the kids to Trivandrum to visit my in-laws. And then COVID hit and she was stuck there. They were stuck there because we could not travel by road. And I was alone at home and I was with my parents. And uh, work was completely in a mess. Family life, we didn't, I mean, I could not see my kids and my wife. It was totally messed up. And I went into deep depression. I lost my sleep. I was an insomniac for I don't know how many months. And I used to, I, I had to take medications at that, at that point. So I think depression hits you differently different levels. Mm. at different levels. And I think there has to be a coping mechanism to understand what, why that hit you and how to get around it. And that is how I do it now. I mean, I lose a lot of patients every week. This, this last week I wrote, about six death summaries for patients aged between 25 and 38, 25 and 40, young males, all died because of alcohol use. And there's nothing I could do about it. 
but there were another six or eight of them who came in really sick and went home to their kids and that is because i take every day as a challenge and depression is not something that i am worried about now it will come and go i just have to focus on what i have to do for that day this outlook <clears throat> what you said uh, in terms of uh, uh, proving your worthiness uh, this of course is agnostic to the field i mean of course it's beyond medical i mean it's it's yes. an it's an um, average person's um, uh, i would say uh, you know it's a, it's a, it's a how do you say it's a harm to every average person every person right now in your case in particular uh, do you think that fabric still somewhere haunts you to who you are today and i say it from the lens that uh, because you are an outlier in a sense that you are so active on social media uh, that's where most of your peer uh, community members mostly medical practitioners are not uh, right is that still an anchor to who you are today that proving that worthiness or is there's a different lens to it no i mean i i don't i mean that whole aspect of proving worthiness now doesn't feature in my day to day activities because proving my worthiness is a different kind of definition for me now mm. right so what i do is to do everything for my patients and their families and also to give myself the time that i need right so that is how i prove the worthiness now because if i am healthy in my mind i am healthy for my patients so that way it, the whole aspect of showing yourself or showcasing yourself on social media it's 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 not a priority because if i just stop twitter today i would still keep doing what i'm what i'm doing even now even though, without all that good painting and coating around it i would still do it and i would still be uh i would still keep that uh, self esteem that you know i am doing something for my patient the way it has to be done you know it's not i i am not lost anymore i have found my way right so the because i have found my way and i'm not saying that i have found my way in a way in in the sense that i am fully enlightened and i know exactly what to do for everything that is coming my way i'm not saying in that sense i'm saying that i know that you i mean doctors as i mean as a doctor i'm talking as a doctor it is important that you stick by the rules but also you should bend the rules towards benefit of your patients not towards benefit for you so that way i feel that i'm i'm do, i have to do good every day so this way that worthiness comes because mm. when you push yourself to do what is right by the other person who is coming to you that makes you worthy so i'm i'm happy that when people come to me and uh, they get better that's like 10 on 10 satisfaction for me sure. but sometimes they die but then the family members come to me and tell me that you know we were very happy under you or we were happy with your service even though we lost the patient the way i took them on that journey breaking myself uh, that was that was their satisfaction so that way i have proved my worthiness again so it's it's the whole the twitter and the social media aspect of it it's not to prove worthiness it's for me as a tool to educate others sure. that you should also be uh, you should also find that self reflection and find worthiness in you only then you can be worthy for i mean deserving sure. and useful for other people yeah yeah so i want to get into uh, uh, the genesis of what you do um, on twitter for which you are famous and infamous but before that Uh, i remember reading somewhere that uh, a typical doctor usually um, lives 10 years less than an average person is that right yeah so this was from an I- indian medical association survey that okay. was done in kerala okay so they said that uh, patients outlive their doctors and doctors you know die earlier than your general um, population die earlier and this was true this is this is one of the uh, big surveys that was done and uh, isn't that an irony is not Yeah I mean say I mean this the, it has a lot of factors in it so for one uh, doctors would advise everything good for the patients but they themselves won't be doing that in their own lives because they're too busy advising their patients like for example um, say I'm just going to give a simple example where um, I would tell my patient to work out every day for 30 minutes do an aerobic workout do strength training and all that and I reach home at 9 pm at night and i'm so exhausted i just want food and i want to sleep i want to catch up on my sleep so that i can be fresh for the next day for my new set of patients right so i have no time to work out i have no time to do anything so the next day morning i'll go and see another patient like the other one and i'll say same thing 
and I'll keep doing that. So I'll advise them what is whatever is good for them, but I would not be doing that for myself. So the whole work ethics or the work protocol uh, makes it uh, difficult for many doctors to become healthy themselves. They, 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 they lose it at some point. And this is one of the reasons why doctors are actually the he- un- most unhealthy people in, uh, uh, wow. yeah, yeah, in the and, community. And this, and this is not specific to India or Kerala. I would assume this is probably a common I, I, fabric. I, I, I'm everywhere. sure. I'm sure. I mean, I think it is very, it's, it's really, really exaggerated in India because we don't have any work timings and yeah. schedules, right? I mean, you see in the US, doctors have to work this many hours a week. If they have a night, they'll get two days off. I mean, it's all set in stone. When I was doing my DM, I used to work 36 hours straight, 36 hours straight and then catch up on 7 hours of sleep and then get back the next day for another 24 hours. So this was the kind of work that we used to do. So I think the whole systematic uh, protocols in place for doctors in India is making them unhealthy and I don't think it's it's the choice that doctors have made for themselves that they are going to become unhealthy for their patients. I don't think so. I think it's the way that things work out here. But is there any intervention because that's, I mean, that's a very important um, strata of our society who is essentially a foundation to a large part of the population to stay healthy. So we are kind of losing them. I mean, there is exactly. attrition, there's a huge amount of attrition there, right? So I know, I know. What, what can be an intervention there to keep that number lower? I mean, 10 years is a huge gap. Uh, I mean, I think I can take this question in two ways. One is from a comfort zone where I am in and second is from a regulatory zone where which which also features authorities. Right. So so what I did was that uh, since last many years, I was doing what every doctor was doing. So I was working from morning till late evening, coming back home, watching some TV, writing some clinical research stuff, uh, going to sleep, getting up the next day and doing the same thing all over again from Monday to Saturday. Right. And at some point I realized that, you know, life is not about just doing that. It's more about being able to spend time with your family, which is going to be good for your mental health and also spending time alone, giving yourself some time, which is also good for your physical health. So you can do more for yourself. And I, I have this, I had that privilege to make it a, a, a Monday to Friday uh, workday for myself because we have a consultancy uh, company. My dad started it. So we have about 12 to 14 doctors in our consultancy group and we give uh, advanced and um, uh, more, uh, what do you call, uh, specialized services to uh, tertiary care centers, So which is what we are doing. So we currently work at Rajagiri Hospital, it's a tertiary level hospital and I give hepatology and transplant services there. My dad and the other team gives gastroenterology and advanced endoscopy services there. So we are an autonomous unit. We have a revenue sharing model. So we can make decisions for ourselves. So if, if I if I was part of Rajagiri Hospital, I would have to work every day, including Saturday, from the timings that they tell me. Like when I'm you say a, you're part, I'm sorry. When you say part, means you're like a, in a pay, on the payroll of the yeah exactly. Uh, so when I'm if I have, if I'm the employee of that sure. uh, in okay. a hospital, so I have to work from nine to five and you know, all days and things like that. So but because I, I we are autonomous, I can make the decision where according to what I want to. So I, I work Monday to Fridays, so I, I take care of my mental and physical health that way. But not all doctors can do that because a lot of them work in the public sector, a lot more work in the private sector. They have to follow corporate rules, they have to follow the public health uh, regulations. So um, a, a, a doctor in the uh, in a medical college, government medical college would be seeing about 200 patients in a day from morning 9 to evening 6 and uh, he has no luxury to say that, you know, I'm going to work only Monday to Friday one day, right? So in that situations, so if doctors who can make choices for themselves, they can definitely uh, plan a way out where they can improve on their own physical and mental health by making those choices for themselves like I have made. But if doctors cannot do that and they are within a system, then I think this has to come from the authorities. For example, we need good laws and regulations on mental health and improving physical health among the doctor and healthcare community. Not just doctors, nursing staff. Yeah. They go through hell, especially the ICU staff. It's crazy for them. And when if the hospital is exceptionally accredited, you know, like we have this JC accreditation and ABH, I mean, it's just paperwork. It's nothing else. There is no actual uh, clinical work or patient work going on. It's just paperwork. They are so burdened with every part of it. Even their mental health and um, you know physical health is down the drain. So all of that has to be taken care of from such 
at a higher level sure. they can't make decisions for themselves and i think india lacks that the indian regulatory system even though it may be on paper that how things should be it has not come to the ground level so something has to be done to protect the healthcare force so that like we said sure. they should not die yeah. so early of course yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, so i want to change the gear and uh, get to the uh, something which i have been look, uh, looking forward uh, which is the clinical researcher part of yours and the work what you do mostly and since uh, since the time i've been following you on twitter um, a very common topic uh, you know there were few jargons which were thrown to me uh, i'm someone who always knew this one thing called medicine that's it right so you, when you are unhealthy or you you are ill you are under the weather you go to a doctor takes a medication but now i have a lot of jargons i have modern medicine i have alternative medicine i have evidence based medicine i have integrated medicine yeah. so i want you to give a very laymanish break up of what is what and for a 21st century person uh what tools do they have to choose and decide what's good for them um, um so i mean i mean let me take that question first that uh, the last part that you have yeah. asked regarding medicine per yeah. se um it's all complicated now right i mean healthcare is one place where you have a lot of conspiracies and uh, a lot of things at stake um if you ask me i mean i mean this is from what i am gathering from whatever is been in the literature and in the medical field what i am sure even other doctors would definitely agree with me is that we have medicine right okay. everything else is 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 abominations around it right so you have medicine which is your real medicine you can make, you can call it evidence based medicine which is medicine that is based on evidence at hand so there is empirical evidence to do something for the patient or do nothing for the patient um based on that you work for the patient that is evidence based medicine uh but sometimes like like i mean i'm sure that you would also have come across this saying that you know a lot of the published evidence may not be actually true yeah so a lot of uh, work might be funded there might be biased works published so when you say evidence based medicine it might not be that that evidence there is actually good enough so we use the other term science based medicine so that is sbm instead of ebm mm. so science based medicine is even better because science is something that is very dynamic it has its own definition and it moves yeah. the way it has to so it corrects itself so whenever we say science based medicine so the medicine that i practice may be about so a, a, a classical example is when my dad was practicing as a gastroenterologist in this place called kutatugulam very small town in kerala uh, 35 40 years back uh, when somebody used to come with jaundice at that time that is yellowness of the eyes so so many people think that jaundice is a disease it is not it is actually a sign and a symptom so sign is when a doctor can actually see it in the eye that is a sign and a symptom is when the patient can also feel or see it so jaundice is both it's a sign and a symptom it's not a disease it's part of a disease or a or an outcome of a disease so when patients with jaundice used to come may be, may it be hepatitis a or hepatitis b or hepatitis e whatever the cause of jaundice was at that time he could only give one one stuff for them so that was something known as philanthus neruri in kerala we call it as kidar nelli it's a it's a herb mm. and based on old ancient yeah. scriptures this herb used to treat jaundice as mm. per i mean that was observation at that time so i'm i have a a, a beautiful uh, prescription which he wrote in the 19 late 1970s on for a patient with uh, hepatitis b he is written kidar nelli in that philanthus extract as a treatment so he was following what was available at that time now fast forward to 30 40 years now you have one of the best medications to treat hepatitis b now which is tenofovir alfenamide and there are multiple new drugs coming in something known as mirclodex b which will knock off hepatitis b from within the cell nucleus also that good medications are coming now so i won't write philanthus neruri now just because my father wrote it a long back i will i will write tenofovir alfenamide for my patients so that is why it is science based medicine because during the course of last few decades it has corrected itself and come to a place where what is available best is what we can use now coming to the other aspects of it so you have so medicine is medicine and it's ideally when you say medicine it is taken for granted that it is science based medicine okay so now you have functional medicine and you have holistic medicine and you have integrated medicine so many other things so all of these are just science sounding terms which hijack the actual medicine just to propel 
their sales or their promotions and they are in no way related to actual medical practice and they are not scientific so functional medicine is actually a kind of grift you know you have you have you you i mean a lot of mbbs i'm very sorry to I mean, see this and say this a lot of mbbs graduates when they don't get through to i mean it's a it's a cutthroat competition now so sure. many people passing out so when they don't get through through the proper medical streams after they pass out their bachelors they choose these kind of things so either they become they do a fellowship in integrative medicine or they do a fellowship in functional medicine and what they do is they do proper medical practice for example for the medical practice is prescription which is actually not along with that they would do something like wellness and you know motivation and holistic approach treating the root cause and stuff like that which is actually all obnoxious things it it does not have any science in it so functional medicine is that integrative medicine is totally different monster altogether because you have actual medicine there so there are there is a neurologist or a cancer specialist giving chemotherapy radiotherapy or giving some immunoglobulins or biological treatments to a patient and on top of that they'll be telling oh no take these herbs also or do uh, this particular set of holistic exercise or uh, take this homeopathy uh, along with it which may actually improve your condition so that is integrative medicine where something that works is mixed with something that does not work and you say that it the whole thing worked because you mixed that thing that, that did not work out in the first place so you mix ayurveda or homeopathy or any such pseudo scientific practices within actual medical practice and claim that you know this works better it does not it only increases the cost and causes more of adverse events so i had a very interesting uh, debate a parley with uh, an integrative medicine specialist for the hindu podcast recently so he is a person who uh, who is a neuroscience uh, guy who works and a psychiatrist he works on mental health autism spectrum and all those things and uh, he treats patients with all of this naturopathy and ayurveda and everything along with your proper evidence based i mean science based medicine which is cognitive behavioral therapy antidepressants and things like that which makes no sense to me because for one they have no evidence to show that the combination works better or the combination is cost effective and two they can't do anything without the actual medicine not being there hmm. so if you take out the actual medical part of, out of it and just put the integrative part i mean the the other medical part into it it doesn't work so they know that so that is why they integrate both and ultimately it is the patients who pay for such uh, practices so functional medicine integrative medicine patients have to pay a lot more than they are more than they are supposed to pay because it just increases cost burden resource burden and also adverse events in these patients so in layman's term anything other than uh, alternative medicine is definitely the whole practice of different kinds of medicine which is not coming in the standard of care ayurveda is an alternative medicine traditional chinese medicine is an alternative medicine acupressure i mean any traditional practice that you take at a regional level for example in japan we have kampo medicine which is a traditional medicine in japan uh, in india it is ayurveda which is our own traditional medicine so these are all alternative medicine practices so they have not they can never withstand the test of scientific method but they just you know piggyback on uh, sure. other aspects of medicine and just move along so uh, you know one one thing what you said was that science has to evolve it has to progress that's the definition of progress right now for example integrated medicine uh, and my laymanish understanding is that it, it, it's mixing but for anything to progress uh, for one to understand the evidence there has to be an empirical data right so for these practices uh, and i'm just coming from a lens of curiosity do we is this been is this form of practice been done for a long time that we have data to now squash it to say that this is right or wrong or or can one who is practicing this say that okay you know this is very short and we yet are collecting the data so therefore you cannot come and say that this is not right because we are also collecting the data to therefore prove that there is an evidence to it yeah so this is very interesting right i am happy this question has come because there is two things to it one is integrative medicine practitioners are not uh, happy to get the integrative practice tested okay because some of them know that testing it would not actually give them the outcome that they want right so they don't test it they are just happy doing it but there are a lot of groups both in india and the west that have actually done uh, studies on integrative medicine versus conventional 
And most of these studies and assimilation of those studies, which we call as meta-analysis or systematic reviews, have shown that these did not improve outcomes. So these may actually improve uh, subjective outcomes. For example, somebody, a group of people might feel better. They'll say that they felt better. Mm. But you have nothing to show clinically or from test point of view that they actually improved. And there are studies that have shown that only the cost burden has increased and the effects were the same when you actually did integrative medicine or if you actually did this, I mean, went for the standard of care medicine. So there are studies that show, show that. And a lot of these uh, integrative medicine um, protocols or, or institutes that practice this, they would never, I mean, they're cowards. They would never test it because they know if they tested it, it would not stand the test of scientific method. So the saying is that if you mix apple pie with cow pie, the apple pie doesn't taste better. It gets worse. Yeah. So it's not like the cow pie is going to taste better. The apple pie is going to taste worse. So that is integrative medicine. Yeah, but look, uh, and again, uh, I, I'm not pro, I'm not anti, I'm just uh, trying to remain very curious that the scientific medicine, which has a huge history to it, uh, right? it's a legacy to it. And something gives me an impression that the integrated medicine is probably a recent phenomena. I'm not sure. I mean, uh, I don't know what, how would you define the time? No, I, I think it's, it's the opposite. Okay. I mean, the integrative medicine part, definitely it's very new. Yeah. But the stuff that they be integrating, right? They oh, just, are very yeah. ancient. Correct, correct. Right. And modern medicine is like, what, 200 years old? Sure. So anything to now, so integrated medicine, nothing but you are, you know, combining the traditional bit or the functional bit to the scientific bit, right? But the entire outcome piece has to kind of also evolve in its own journey and therefore come out. So like you said that the data, what might out been there, the few who have gone the data might have come out with an outcome that, I mean, might have come with an result that there's no outcome in terms of no positive outcome. But do you think that that also need its own churn and time to go through repeated such uh, experiments to eventually now come up and say, okay, no, X many years have gone by. Even now we don't have an outcome, but that timeline is not gone through yet. So I think this is this, I have an answer to this actually, because it depends under what principle or hypothesis that you're integrating it. For example, let, let me take an example of homeopathy, right? Classical homeopathy. I'm not talking about the adulterated version, real classical homeopathy, ultra diluted formulations, which are nothing but either sweetened water or alcohol. I mean, this is a known fact, it's an open secret. Uh, just two days back, the, I mean, I just tweeted about it also. The uh, largest manufacturer of homeopathy in Germany, uh, Wilmar Schwabe, they sent me a statement saying that, you know, it's impossible for you to find anything in our products because it's so diluted. Then how do you, how did you get uh, side effects in your paper? So they actually asked me that. <laughs> so homeopathy, you take the classical homeopathy, which Wilmar Schwabe makes, nothing in it. Now there is a, a patient uh, who has cancer and you are giving chemotherapy to that patient and you are going to add homeopathy to it, right? So what, what, what do you, what, what is your, uh, what are you going to test for? Take an example that the side effects of chemotherapy will reduce. Hmm. If you don't add homeopathy versus you add homeopathy, right? Now you know that homeopathy, whatever you're doing for that patient has nothing in it, right? And you are doing a test or wasting resources on a principle that is basically rotten at the core. It is not correct to even hypothesize that you're doing something for the patient and adding nothing to it will improve the patient. Mm. Right. So the principles are more important than the outcome that you're studying. So you can't mix something that is completely divergent. Now homeopathy has nothing in it. So let's take something which has something in it. Take an Ayurvedic preparation, highly active, lot of potent uh, herbs and fire plant chemicals in it. Right. Now you take chemo, uh, chemotherapy, you give a group of patients Ayurvedic herbs, another group you do not give Ayurvedic herbs. And you found out that, you know, in the, the uh, population who is getting, the group who is getting the Ayurvedic herbs actually had lesser side effects. Okay, I mean, that's a positive thing. So giving Ayurvedic herbs along with chemotherapy actually improved outcome there. Now, how did it improve? Because you are giving that patient a group of herbs which has millions, uh, thousands and ten thousands of plant chemical inside it. And what worked? It's impossible for you to find, find out. And there is, when you do this study in a longer duration, you find out that some patients are actually developing a lot of side effects. Which means something was actually working, but now something else inside that is causing side effects. And you are nowhere because you know it is helping, but at some point it is not helping also. And you have no idea what is helping and what is not. 
So this is the problem with Ayurveda because it's so complex and the, the principles are so raw. You are not able to reduce or deduce anything out of it when you mix it with something that you already know about. So that way, if you look at doing studies on integrative medicine, even if you find something out of it, may positive or negative, you are not, you will not be able to properly pinpoint exactly what is causing harm or exactly what is causing benefit. You can't, you can't standardize it. So tell me in amongst this entire spectrum, something what you also commonly refer to is, what is quackery and what is pseudoscience? Yeah, so quackery is basically uh, a practice and pseudoscience is basically a principle. So when you say something is pseudoscientific, it means that that particular uh, uh, practice or that particular principle is untestable or unfalsifiable. For example, I am saying that, you know, uh, I am an Ayurveda practitioner and inside you, your Vata, Pitha and Kapha are under imbalance. So I am going to balance it with these herbs. So you are going to ask me, how do you measure my yeah. Vata? Yeah. I will change the topic. Right, because I have no idea what Vata is, where it is and how I am going to measure it. Because it is not measurable, it is untestable. And you cannot, you cannot show people this is Vata and this is Pitta or this is Kapha. You can't. Because that is a pseudo-scientific principle. So there is no markers which can define how my Absolutely measure Absolutely not. Okay. I mean, I am waiting for, uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a debate that I have been having with Ayurveda since 2016 and nobody has given me an answer. So they will give you philosophical answers. Right, so if they'll say that if you're healthy this way or if they are diseased this way, it's your vata increasing, this is your kappa decreasing and all that. But they will never give you measurements on it. But you mean to say that's not, uh, that's not a measure, uh, measurable outcome to say whether there's a progress in terms of the No, outcome. you can't even measure it at uh, all. Okay. So you're not going to even look at an outcome there. But what about the character? I mean, physiological character, what they're saying. No, even that is not standardized, right? Okay. So they'll say that you are a vata dominant person and mm. you are a pitta dominant person. If you go and read the Ayurvedic text, I mean, I have done this. I have, a, I have all the textbooks in my room. If you go and read that, you'll be more confused actually because there are so many things overlapping in vata, pitta, kapha, characteristics that they have given, it is impossible for you to actually identify all of that in a person. So that is pseudoscience, which you cannot test, you cannot even follow. Like, like you say, I am saying there is God. So you, you are asking me, show me where is God. So you, I am telling you, no, you have not proven there is no God. Right. So you, it, it goes like that. You know, it is all philosophical. No, we will not get anywhere. That is what pseudoscience is. Quackery is something totally different. Quackery is basically you are doing something which you are not aware of at all. For example, there are these traditional healers who have not, uh, who don't know anything about uh, Ayurveda or homeopathy or whatever. Uh, they have some knowledge gained from their families or something given down the lane and they use that to treat people. So they have absolutely no qualifications, no idea about the human body, no idea about physiology, nothing, but they still treat. So that is quackery. So if, if I am going to, homeopathy is Top level quackery, if you ask me, because it has nothing to do with uh, medicine or human body at all. Because they go completely on vitalism, which is life force. So you ask a homeopath, show me where the life, fo life force is. So how do you measure life force is going down or life force is going up? They'll go philosophical again, because you can't measure the life force. So they'll say that, no, no, you don't have to bother about it. You please take these formulations. It will take care of your life force. So they'll go that way. That, that, that actually is complete quackery, because you are completely neglecting everything in physics, chemistry and biology there. So they have no clue about how the human body works and they are doing that. So that is quackery. So this is the basic difference. One is a principle and one is a practice. So a lot of this has also a connotation to how you are, um, I have to use this word which I am not sure whether it makes sense, engineered as a doctor uh, uh, or a practitioner, right, in terms of what practice you pursue. There is something which uh, you have said it in the past, I am quoting it, which says that every, every doctor should not just be a doctor but a doctor scientist. Yes. Uh, right? Can you elaborate, elaborate what does that mean? So that doctor scientist is when you don't, um, you don't convince yourself that you are going, you, ha you have a 9 to 5 job. Like for example, I get up, freshen myself, put on my coat, I go to hospital, I see 35 patients, listen to them, prescribe, 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 go back home. Come back the next day, do the same stuff. Mm. That is a doctor. Actually, that is not doctor because the actual meaning of doctor is different. It is a teacher. Right. So, I mean, I'll come back to that. So, that is what a normal doctor does. Goes, sees patients, prescribes, comes back. Takes rounds, make decisions, prescriptions, comes back. But a doctor scientist is somebody who has a clinical practice, but who also pursues clinical research. 
a simple example from my own experience I'm, i i i can tell you is when i was doing my uh dm in in, uh, in new delhi in ilbs we had this group of patients with a condition called as alcohol associated hepatitis so that is when uh, alcohol um, use disorder patients when they consume heavy amounts of alcohol over a short period of time or intermittently consume lot of alcohol that is known as binge drinking they come with the condition known as alcoholic hepatitis where you have sudden onset severe jaundice uh, fluid abdo- fluid in the abdomen building of fluid in the abdomen they'll have brain failure infections they bleed and they are the group of patients who have very high death rate so close to 90% of them will die in 6 months without treatment so in such patients what we standard we used to do was to give them steroids and this has been proven since decades research since 1960s and 70s this research has been there where they have shown that if you give short course of steroids these patients we can help them survive the first 28 days so a lot of them don't die in the first 28 days usually 60 to 70 percent of them die in the first 28 days if they have complications with alcoholic hepatitis and when you give steroids that survival improves and uh, but there are there is a group they don't respond to steroids or you cannot give them steroids for example those who have active infections or they have very high uh, uncontrolled diabetes you can't give them steroids so those patients what we used to do is you come for i mean you treat them symptomatically just give them supportive care nutrition symptom care things like that out of that 50% of them will die it's a very tough group to manage so there are there are no recommended treatments or approved treatments for severe alcohol associated hepatitis you manage them with steroids if you can if they don't respond to steroids the next option is either they die or they go for a transplant so liver transplant becomes the only next option which is not easy for everyone to do in our country you know in a country like india especially when somebody is a recent drinker so somebody who is heavily drinking and you put them on a transplant uh, you do a, you do a liver transplant for them they'll go back to drinking after some time because they're now in a they're, fresh organ yeah so i had a patient who was so keen on getting a transplant done and ultimately i found out the motive was that he knew that his cirrhotic liver is not going to take any more alcohol so he wanted a new liver to drink again that was his motivation to go for a transplant it was it's that crazy so we can't transplant them suddenly right so they, they are then bound to die so in such patients what to do next so my professor professor shiv sarin said that uh, i mean we have theses right so we do theses work uh, in your thesis select a topic which is going to be of use to people so this is where the clinical research kicks in so uh, i was thinking what to do uh, for uh, this group of patients so this is a group that we see very commonly there and uh, i was just searching searching i found out that there, there was this group of french researchers who did some brilliant work on mice on rats and mice where they found out that when they gave uh, mice or rats alcohol and they developed severe alcohol liver disease and they compared that with a group of mice that did not develop alcohol liver disease they found out that a big change happened within the bacteria inside the intestines so we all have bacteria i mean we are rich in lot of microorganisms right and the maximum load is inside the gut and a lot of these bacteria are good they they do metabolism and make products that are going to help us with our health but when the presence of alcohol this completely gets disrupted and bad guys come in bad bacteria comes in and the bad bacterial products and metabolic uh, products they actually cause more harm to the host thereby injuring the liver also so this whole aspect of alcohol changing the gut microbiota came from those studies from france it is brilliant and uh, mice are like humans only they love alcohol so if you give mice uh, some alcohol uh, water and then give put up a, a, a bottle of or a, a cup of water plain water with and another cup of plain water with alcohol they'll run to the one with alcohol, alcohol. yeah so they, it's very easy to do alcohol studies in them because they're very mentally they are like humans only with when it comes to alcohol and i found out that you know uh, this is something very new same time a group of researchers in the us figured out that in a condition called as clostridium difficile infection which is actually a very severe infection of the large intestine where a bacteria completely destroys the large intestine causing ulcers and causes a lot of death in elderly especially in the icu so they they figured out that when they gave fresh uh, stool uh, through an enema or through a small uh, feeding tube into the small intestine from healthy people healthy okay so they took stool from healthy people processed it made it into a suspension and gave it to these patients either uh, up uh, from above or from below mm. 
they found out that clostridium difficult infection just vanished and these people survived much better so the good guys beat the bad guys in that so i applied that thought in alcoholic hepatitis patients so i told my sir sir so this is something that is happening so we have some basic science proof that microbiota changes can happen with alcohol so what if we give these patients stool from healthy people that was my thesis and what we did was in the initial pilot trial we treated about eight patients of severe alcohol related liver disease uh, we gave them fresh stools from their uh, i mean healthy people in the family we took them screened them for other infections everything was fine we took fresh stool samples every day processed them in our lab i still remember this i did i did this manually and i used to do this manually people will feel yucky but it was done for the patients and it is a fantastic treatment and it has now found its way yeah. as an approved therapy for various yeah. conditions so yes. it's not a, a bad thing so what i used to do initially was to manually strain it and you have no idea how, how that feels you patients give you the fresh stool sample you put it in a linen cloth and you manually strain it out and take that whatever you get and then you put a tube through the nose and give it to the patient in the small intestine I did that initially until my wife felt really bad about it and she said please take my kitchen blender <laughs> that kitchen blender and she told me specifically after you finish your course don't bring the blender back home right so my kitchen blender is actually a vintage product it is still lying there in the institute i have not got it back and my jone batches who did the same experiments used that right so it's a philips blender and then i started using the blender to mix the stool suspension and then i started doing it so we did this study and then we compared to a group where they we did not give fresh stool samples and it was just crazy what we identified within a year 30% of patients were alive only alive in the standard of care those who did not receive stool suspension versus 80% who were who received stool suspension so which means we had a 50% survival increment in patients who were receiving stool transplant in that small study and we published that i mean i presented that uh, i mean at that time as a plenary presentation in the american association of study of liver diseases annual conference liver meeting where i they gave me the best paper award also for that and uh, we published that in the american gastroenterology associations official journal clinical and gastro gas clinical gastroenterology and hepatology as an original research paper and it is one of the highest cited papers in stool transplantation even now and after that we had other groups from pj chandigarh from other groups from amrita and various other groups doing this even in the west they they took our protocol and they did this for the patients and they found out that their patients were actually surviving so we have validation also it's not just our finding so this became something very, really different so when people now come to us who have no options for a steroid or a liver transplant this is what we do so the american gastroenterology association's guidelines for management of alcohol hepatitis has mentioned our uh, protocol as one of the salvage therapies to preserve life and this happened because i was a Clinical doctor research. clinician scientist no i mean um, kudos thank you uh, for you and your team to uh, kind of put together uh, this research but i'm still going back and kind of thinking first principles right i mean you said it took you almost 16 years of education or more uh, to have that perspective and mindset of having a clinical uh, you know research a clinical scientist per, a background with the medicinal or the medical practitioner background you have got so there are two things which comes a a population like india right where the scientific temperament is uh, almost negative if not zero right mm -hmm. to have that infrastructure ecosystem uh, do you think that's feasible that we have anyway our doctor to patient ratio is so skewed right uh, compared to other western world right uh, to, for someone to go through that long cycle of education also layer themselves with uh this additional lens and then come into the practice visa be and then this another lens that in in a situation where i understand in a emergency situation someone can refer back now because there's a data point but in a typical situation where there's no empirical evidence or data they would be relied to going back to the the perspective of a typical uh, mbbs doctor mm -hmm. right i mean they would not, they won't have that bandwidth now because the patient is in critical stage so now go back and refer back to the data how do you think both these aspects fall in well in terms of having that perspective like what you said that everyone should have because it's all about having the ecosystem i mean this is very true and i i would say that i was lucky to have such teachers so the teachers that i had during my masters training in calcutta were completely into clinical medical practice right mm. so i used to do maybe like 
one or two MRI brain in a year for my patients there because one they could not afford afford at all. Two, my my uh, professor used to say that medicine is like math. It's one plus one is two. So if you have a brain problem, you can identify it when, with your clinical examination. You don't need a machine to tell you what it is. So they used to train me like that. So that I received that from them. And when I went into my DM uh, uh, tr uh, training, uh, it was all about doing research. So like you said, that ecosystem should be perfect. And I'm not sure that if such an ecosystem is prevalent everywhere, because not all teachers teach this way, their students. My, my teacher, I'm, I'm, I'm just lucky to be there. Uh, my teachers always, uh, like Professor Shipsarin, he was always very keen that we should not leave academics behind. You have to have this in your practice. Even after you join a private hospital or a private sector, you have to keep it alive because that is the only way that you can do better. But this does not happen with everyone. I mean, you look at uh, public health institutes like, you know, I mean, like center institutes like AIMS and PJ and all. It's fine because they have an academic program running. They have a lot of clinical research happening. But when you look at state level colleges or even private hospitals that do DNB training, they don't have such an ecosystem to train the students to become doctor scientists in, and they are just made to become doctors. So I think this, this is very important. And if, see now I, what I do is I try my best, whoever, whichever student comes to me and or whoever, whoever is exposed to me, I make sure that I teach them the way I was taught and they will teach their students the way they were taught. So this is how you pro pro propagate and promote that kind of uh, good clinical practice with research and 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 slowly and steadily I think it will catch up because clinical research is now becoming a very important aspect in daily medical practice because there was something known as um, publish or perish previously but that was typically for institutional policies for example if somebody wants to have an additional professorship or professorship you have to publish this much during these many years only then you can get that particular post so that was the publish and perish thing but here publish and perish is means for the patient so now even patients, their families, I mean, everything is there now on social media and on the internet. They look at doctors who are more credible. So they have a lot of publications. They are more academic and patients come to those doctors or patients tend to go to those doctors now. So initially a doctor was a good doctor was somebody who used to see 100 patients a day. So they'll say that, you know, see that doctor, he has only 10. He is, this guy has 100. So let's go to him. Right. So that aspect is now getting changed. And patients with 10 or 12 doctors or 15 doctors, if he has a good academic profile, a, a good uh, a research profile, people would want such doctors to take care of them now. So that, that, that ecosystem will slowly change. So now the whole training should also change in that way. But do you think, uh, so there are two sides. One is the business of care. One yeah. is the patient care. Do you think both can coexist? I think it can. So if you, if you do ethical practice, you will have your turnover of patients. Like I see 25, 30 patients a day only. Some other hepatologists might be seeing 100 or 120 patients a day. Yeah. So the work I'm doing on 25 or 30 patients will be equal to, or the revenue generated will be equal to the 120 that he's seeing there. Because the quality of work is what matters, not the quantity. And very importantly, the, uh, the aspect of uh, ethical practice versus business. See, I mean, you can do a business of healthcare anywhere very very simple is that you don't you don't even have to do i mean you can do ethical practice but on the side you fix a wellness clinic you fix an integrated clinic you can do business of practice with that you don't need to be unethical in your practice to do you know you see a lot of corporate hospitals i mean my hospital included i mean the one place i'm i'm working in they have an ayurveda uh, unit they have a huge ayurveda department right so that is one of the arguments that people bring in so that if i was running that place it will not be there definitely but they have yeah. an Ayurveda clinic there and a huge department there. But they get money out of it. But it's also, again, going back to the original, the way you are placed yourself in your practice, it's a conscious choice that you want to do only 25, you want to only meet 25 patients a day. You don't want them to commission, uh, you know, or you only send maybe two patients a, a month on MRI scans. Mm -hmm. But then they are, uh, the, on, on the business side of the care, you get... Uh, incentives and you get uh, more upside when you are getting more diagnostics done, more blood markers yeah, done. Yeah. But all that is hidden with a layer of patient care because the lens, what a layman knows is that if I don't go through the scan, if I don't go through the blood markers, the doctor might not know what's happening inside my body. 
right and i am often i am often questioning myself right i mean you know in the past many times i've gone myself and with my family and i have questioned why is an x ray or a scan relevant here because it doesn't make sense yeah. but then questioning the status quo is not something which is taught in our culture right i mean right. if a doctor right. is said right. something that's in golden words yeah. so it just uh, i mean that's then layered a package as um, patient care yeah. because you don't know yeah i mean the the whole aspect of mri that was during my training not now now most of the patients yeah. i see have to do a ct because most of them have yeah, cancer and things yeah. like that but the the way to answer this question is that see there there are two ways to it one is that a patient who was there maybe like 25 years before is not the patient that we deal with now for example patients themselves are now dependent on investigational practice so you have clinical practice and you have investigational practice in clinical practice you treat the patient in investigational practice you treat the paper you treat the reports right so i can do any of that i mean doctors choose to do one of those i choose to do clinical practice a lot of patients when i do clinical practice for example i'll say that you know you don't need this test because the screening has is fine i'll tell you the simplest example of fatty liver disease a lot of people come with non alcoholic fatty liver they get referred to me and i see them and they have grade 1 or grade 2 or grade 3 whatever fatty liver on ultrasound and they have a normal liver function test in those patients we do something known as a fib4 scoring which is a simple investigation blood investigation based calculator you type in those reports i mean type in those values there and you'll get a score if the score is less than 1.45 the chances that that person has an advanced liver disease is very unlikely and you don't need to further test them so i do that for all my patients and if i see a score higher than 1.45 i ask them to do something known as a shear wave or a fibro scan or an mr elastography which will tell me exactly how stiff the liver is or if there is cirrhosis or not but when i tell some of them that you know your score is below this and you don't need any further uh, investigations they'll ask me but we have heard mr elastography is a very good test please write it for us right so i write it for them because they have asked me and then there are doctors who don't want to miss anything i mean that might be their ideal logic but they have found out that that logic brings them money right so they'll do fat liver disease patient comes so they'll do blood test they'll do mr screening they'll do liver function test they'll do everything and then everything will come normal they'll say you see everything is normal you're fine that patient is happy but there'll be another group of patients they'll do everything and they'll say it's fine it's fine and they've already spent 35 to 40000 rupees for nothing but is there a window where how would you how would you judge or evaluate whether that doctor who is in their checklist whatever they are asking is it from a from a business point of view or from a patient care because they might need an entire I mean, you know it's holistic it's simple there are protocols and algorithms that you have to use like for example what i said about fatty liver disease it's an algorithm it's it's in the guidelines this is how you approach a patient who comes with fatty liver disease this is how we approach step 1 step 2 step 3 so if a doctor forgets step 1 step 2 step 3 and directly goes to step 5 where all the investigations are that's not good practice i mean medical field i'm not uh, i mean more so because i've spent significant al- almost all my life in india uh, in india is scary and also um, overwhelming right people go and talk uh, meet a doctor um, from a from a point of view of uh, the last mile uh, savior right i mean this is where we are and also it's scary because sometimes you might just go what you might think is just off cold or viral and might just blow up to be something else right Uh, and i'm trying to connect the dots here that everything what we do as we grow up in india has a lot of nuance to it you know there's a cultural nuance uh, there's a lot of religious nuance uh, you know because we have so much of religious uh, cohorts in the country um a lot of tradition unlearning is very hard yeah. like i'm a malayali and i was t- told from a childhood that i can't have fish curry with curd <laughs> right and uh, i said okay because but i like curd like i i like that that fabric of i can you know mix a fish fry with curd yeah. but my parents say you can't have it i never questioned them now when i'm thinking i'm ad- adult uh, and i'm i'm just i am hoping that my if my son asks i should have an answer because i should give him a logical answer and i'm trying to question and i am not able to get any literature which says that you cannot have fish and curd right yeah. so there's a lot of unlearning process and yeah. that's where i think i feel a lot of our so when we spoke about the different types of medicines those those medicines are also kind of layered around that right yeah. uh, do you think as a now as a clinical researcher as a doctor as a communicator of what's quackery what's pseudo science how much time will it take uh, to make this population unlearn what is right or wrong or beyond time what will it take 
for people to kind of understand first principles what is right or wrong i mean i don't think that is ever going to happen i mean you can change few or some but you can't change everyone so the whole aspect is to not change everyone but at least change a few so when i talk about doing the right thing the right way or being scientific being critical about doing you know critical thinking i i i say that to uh, 10 people and if two of them agree with me that's that's good enough for me because those two will again talk to another 10 and that will actually exponentially rise at some point so we don't we don't look at uh, helping people unlearn on a large scale we look at helping people unlearn in a small scale because it will work out at some point so basically we don't want the whole country to be scientifically uh, you know better or scientifically thing it's, it's it's impossible we can't do that but if uh, at least the majority uh, can do that or at least some who can uh, educate others about what you have been educating them about that that's a win win you know if, if you ask me it's not easy to change you know you can't change i mean my my whole aspect of being on twitter and being harsh the way i am is because i don't want to play the fence sitter role right so i can i can do both ways so i can tell somebody some person might be genuinely considering ayurveda or some some practice as useful because he's had some personal benefit from it i can actually uh, you know just go in and say that yeah i mean personal benefits are okay a lot of people get personal benefits uh, but it is not like that you have this part of science also to it that won't help i'll just cut right and say that you know your personal anecdote is absolute bullshit you know i don't and we don't we don't look at it your personal benefit is yours that does not mean it's generalizable you should think the other way also because there is no actual evidence through scientific method to prove your personal benefit is actually the only benefit so i am very cut right that way so that kind of that kind of attitude has helped me gain some change among the people that are exposed to me and my my way of teaching and i think this is important because i don't want every, everybody to change so i'll i'll uh, do this to 10 people eight of them will abuse me back right but the two will think about it and maybe change that is yeah. what i'm looking at so i'm not looking at 10 of them agreeing with me but do you agree that the scientific temperament in our country uh, is weak it's it's not what where i didn't should terrible. be yeah it's terrible i mean i mean forget the social media i mean i'm sitting in an op and i'm seeing patients day by day and i'm seeing new new patients coming in day by day and there are people who still tells me that they are not taking the yellow yolk of the egg because their jaundice will increase and there are doctors telling patients that there are doctors advising patients not to take oils and fried foods when you have jaundice it's crazy yeah so my father in law wouldn't like it because in the morning uh, i had this debate with him he have was saying having omelet and he took the yellow yolk out i said why he said like uh, that will increase his cholesterol so uh, and i have my thesis i want you to opine on that uh, i used to think that maybe because everyone's in, everyone is not science educated right because these are fundamentals right but then uh, later on as we're growing up i didn't know that's not the case we have an over explosion of cultural nuances in this country where a lot of educated people yeah. also kind of have a very uh, you know different tangents in terms of their thinking because the cultural nuance comes in right with this kind of diversity uh, what will it take to kind of improve the science temperament because when i tweeted and i'm saying i'm going to talk to you what question should i ask i was shocked when people were saying that can we drink water when we wake up <laughs> can we can we eat fruits uh, before uh, we go to yeah, sleep uh, can we walk and have uh, tea i mean one is scientific temperament one one this is illogical right i mean what will it take for some level of scientific temperament to go up because the entire world forget the world i mean less than a single digit percentage of the country is on twitter yeah. where you are right but what will it take for for the uh, population to be there i think conversations like this this is very important because voices should be uh, propagated and exaggerated you know the, my the my, my teaching or another doctor's perspective scientific perspective there should be um there should be some uh, system that will help us raise our voices right so me talking to my patients inside my opd doesn't cut it right so if if we sit here and we are talking about it and now a lot of people will watch this they will understand it 
So I think conversations like this will only help us improve. Like we go on a good podcast, do a, I mean, talk to a, a, an influential person who is willing to hear us out. I mean, those things actually help. And this is the only way because media is not going to do anything of this sort because they have other things to do yeah. because they have other set of things to do. So that is not going to help. So I think these conversations are, are very important. And to add to that, uh, a whole egg a day is fine without any problems because dietary egg does not increase cholesterol. Yeah. This is a myth that has been busted decades ago. So everybody can have that one egg per day with the yolk in it. Nothing is going to happen. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, see, one one downside which I've seen is that we also live in a society, at least in people around me, is that when someone next to you say something, it doesn't come with the trust protocol because that person doesn't have a credential of a doctor. But some doctor or random expert who is on YouTube or any platform who has a certain following, when they something when they say something that has got a lot of trust protocol and I have struggled it with no qualms. I can say I struggle to tell my own family members, uh, you know, first principles that no, it doesn't make sense. Why would you want to do that? No, I, I think that has more to do with confirmation bias because mm -hmm. you tend to listen yeah. to and apply it when somebody tells stuff that you already have in your mind. Right. So you are there in, in, in the family and you're saying that, you know, this is contrary to it. But there is a guy who's randomly sitting on YouTube and telling them that what they already are talking about. Obviously, it makes more sense to them. So this is confirmation bias. And this is why a lot of the problems within our society comes. A lot of them have confirmation biases. And these biases are being handed over down generations and generations because of cultural and traditional dogmas, which we are, we have to break at some point. See, I mean, your generation, my generation, my kids' generation, they will all think differently. Because we are, I mean, I, I'm teaching them things differently to look at everything differently. I mean, I'm sure you, you, you are also doing that. And uh, there are a lot more younger uh, generation, I mean, young fathers and I mean, young parents who t tell the, uh, their kids something totally different from what they have heard from their grandparents, right? So there was this, um, uh, I mean, a myth where they say that don't cut fingernails at night. Right. So this myth was there in the family yeah. and uh, my grandmother, I still remember she, I mean, even when my nail was nails, were now I don't because I keep biting them because I'm all the time stressed. But uh, uh, my, my grandmother, you never used to let my mom uh, cut nails in the night. She'll say, no, you don't do that in the night. But one day I saw my wife cut my uh, child's daughter's nail in the night. And I said, uh, why are you doing that? She said, well, what? She has no idea about that myth at all. She said, it has to be cut. I saw it now. I'm just cutting it. You know, so that, that kind of uh, thinking and change will come. And we, and like you said, there will be a time. I mean, I'm not sure if I was, I'm going to be there or not. Uh, but there will be a time when you will actually have a lot of good critical thinking people, uh, subduing the unscientific minds in this community, in this yeah, society. Yeah. I think again, like we discussed, it's, it's questioning the status quo and that goes, uh, uh, from where you are to the outside world. I, I, I was told again, growing up that you can't have a haircut on your birthday month. <laughs> right. And uh, in the last four or five years, I made sure that I have my haircut on my body, but nothing happened. I went back to my parents and said, I'm still alive. <laughs> but then they said, you know, something might happen during the course of the year. Oh, I might fall or I might then, then they'll, you know, I mean, something might happen. The car might got a bump and then they will connect the dots because you yeah. had a haircut. Yeah. Look, now your vehicle met with an yeah. accident so and is, this thing happened. Yeah, that is cherry picking, right? Yeah. This is post hoc fallacy because B happened after A. So, they are both connected. So this is classical post hoc fallacy. Exactly what happens with homeopathy. Yeah. I mean, you have an asthmatic yeah. kid for about eight years. You tried inhalers and everything for eight years and you are fed up of it. It's, it's been eight years. But usually by the time people are, children are 10 to 12 years, they grow out of their asthma. Right. And now for the la next nine to nine, 10, 11 and 12 years, they try homeopathy along okay. with it. And they'll say that, see, eight years we were on modern medicines and it did not go away. Now three years we added this. Now it's gone. It is supposed to go at 12 years of age. That is why it went away, not because homeopathy was added. So this is the classical post hoc fallacy. Because A hap B happened after A, it is because of A. Uh, this is also what we experience, like we, because modern medicine can also have side effects. We yeah. can't, right? I mean, no we can't, uh, right? Yeah. And therefore, because one thing doesn't work, you go to an alternative. And for someone who is going through an excruciating pain or a certain, uh, you know, illness situation, they possibly will go to an alternative medicine because that gave them a side effect. Now, in that situation, um, uh, as a teacher, uh, as a as a clinical scientist. How do you come back and, you know, put forward your point of view to say that, okay, this can also have a side effect 
others are, because you're saying that others uh, alternative medicine also does have a side effect right yes. then how do you kind of uh, draw a parallel to say that one is good or one is not good because mm-hmm. anything can have a side effect benefits benefits now I'll, i'll tell you a perfect example uh, the commonest cause of drug induced liver injury right so i mean drugs can cause liver injury right painkillers antibiotics the commonest cause of drug induced liver injury in india is tubercular anti tuberculosis drugs so you have these um, four types of antibiotics that we give as part of the national regimen rifampicin isoniazid pyrazinamide those guys uh, they are the commonest cause of drug induced liver injury in india but do we stop treating patients of tuberculosis because you have a group of patients with drug induced liver injury no because the benefits far far outweigh the risks so you you people are surviving i mean tuberculosis was a killer at some point people used to just die it was known as a consumption uh, old term for tuberculosis consumption it used to just snatch patients lives away it was that bad now you can cure it completely millions of lives are saved across the world because of anti tuberculosis drugs but they have side effects so if you keep looking at the side effects only you are going to miss out on a lot of people who are going to die i mean you, you they are going to die without that particular treatment but look at alternative medicine I mean there are no drugs that have been proven yet or feature in any clinical society guidelines which are useful if they are they cease to become alternative medicine they become medicine but alternative medicine is still alternative medicine why because they are alternate in the sense that they have no known benefits and they have side effects so why do you want to use something that has no benefits but side effects known but are you saying that they of course have side effects but do they also have a benefit which will outweigh the side effect just like modern medicine yeah, we don't have evidence for that right because we don't have an evidence exactly there is no empirical evidence so for example look at the uh, simple example of chavan prash so initially we used to give i mean even i have eaten chavan prash a lot in my childhood i mean i used to yeah, give, yeah. and a uh, lot of us have taken, lot of 80s kids would do that yeah, yeah a lot of 80s kids have actually done that i mean uh, that was given for memory boosting and what not yeah. immunity and what not okay yeah. and uh, until now when covid came they said that eat chavan prash it will actually help you prevent covid so a group of guys got together and actually tested it so they gave uh, uh, adults chavan prash one group and one group no chavan prash it's published by the way it's uh, done by an ayurvedic research group and uh, they compared both groups and said that you know the ones who got chavan prash and the ones who did not get chavan prash they had the same outcomes inflammatory markers immune profile everything was the same so chavan prash actually does nothing so when you do that and you find there is no benefit and there are lot of chavan prash products which has it's not standardized right so there might be higher amounts of uh, some particular toxic herb that can actually damage your liver or kidneys so you are using a product which has no evidence to it in the first place and can cause some side effects so that kind of stuff even if patients are uh, willfully going for it they should know that this is what is it, what it is it, this is not an informed health seeking behavior not because modern medicine did not work so the people actually go just because on that particular point so this is not working or this is more side effect so let us do this but they should realize that that has no benefits but can have more of side effects also so they can take a proper informed decision but whose prerogative would that be to go out and find out what the disclaimer is uh, and I'll tell you a situation because i know a very close family member uh, and she was you know almost 50, 60 plus age group she was losing her eyesight <clears throat> Uh, coming from a medical background uh, she she uh, she, uh, she used to work in hospitals and she was from a medical background not doctor and uh, she went to this hospital in kerala uh, you might know it's, know, it's sridhariam. sridhariam right yeah. uh, she went through a i think 30 day odd uh, course residential course she had to stay there and she didn't uh, retain the lost sight but she didn't lose further uh, now when i was trying to ask her like what didn't work and you had spent 20 30 years in modern medicine what didn't work uh, she told me that i didn't see any benefit in the medicines which i was taking when i was doing the modern medicine but here i didn't lose but at least i can feel that it's not uh, i i didn't get back what i lost but i'm not losing further but i could not draw a parallel what does that mean because any medicine could help you if we, uh, the right medicine would help you not to lose the uh, sight yeah. further right so this is where the importance of natural history of a disease comes so every disease has a natural history right so you take the uh, you take a seasonal influenza a viral fever you treat it it will go away in 7 days if you don't treat it it will go away in a week's time that's how it is right so that's a natural history similarly this particular eye problem has a natural history i'm not sure what the diagnosis is but there are certain eye disorders where people lose eyesight over course of many many years and then it reaches a plateau 
it does not worsen further that's that's the way it is it ha it will stop there after a certain point so all these years she was on modern medicine and this was going on going on and then she reached the plateau and the moment she reached that plateau she went for this ayurvedic eye treatment and they just did 30 days only right so this disease which was supposed to plateau at that, that at that particular point plateaued and then she did this on top of that so she felt falsely that this is what made it plateau but this is how it was supposed to be even without that ayurvedic intervention this is exactly what happened with that kenyan uh, person yeah, a kenyan person daughter yeah, something and, and yeah. sridharim was the same thing sridharim oh, was okay. the same uh, same institute that did that also so she had a meningioma a kind of a tumor and they operated on that and a very rare side effect of that operation is that you can injure one of the nerves that go into the eye so that nerve got injured and then she lost vision in that uh, i mean almost lost vision in that eye she went for a lot of things all around from germany to france to everywhere and ultimately landed up in sridharyam she did not gain i mean uh, she started gaining a eyesight after many many years which is actually the natural history of that particular disease so you have an injury to that particular nerve it takes many years for that nerve to regenerate and some of the vision to come back so all of those years it was slowly coming back the by the time she went to this ayurveda clinic it was coming back better and she thought that you know the ayurveda actually has done it when even without ayurveda that would have happened this is the post hoc fallacy that i was talking about before how do you go and address this situation because here you have a situation where someone is giving you a ray of hope uh, right look you're going to get what you've lost or possibly you won't lose something beyond what you've already gone through right that's that's a that's a huge ray of especially when it's life and death situation to now again go back and expect scientific temperament what we were talking or have disclaimers because you won't you won't weigh what the side effect is uh instead of the benefit what you can see right so how yeah. do you how do you address that especially um i don't know i mean i feel that you know we as a society we are very vulnerable these days yeah uh, we are right? we are and i'm i'm we are not not just vulnerable we are we give personal experiences and anecdotes a lot more importance than what actual importance should be given to that is why we never have we never discuss personal experience or benefits as part of our scientific evidence because like 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 uh, like i told you about these two cases there are a lot of confounders in that right so you have you you don't know what disease it is number one they'll just say we had this we were losing eyesight and suddenly it stopped so you don't know what disease so if you know what the, exactly that disease is and we know that exactly at this point that disease would stop moving further it's easier for us to convince them now take a take the case of a disease called retinitis pigmentosa which is a slowly progressive disorder which will make you completely blind now imagine doing ayurveda in that they will still become blind it will not stop anywhere so that is the whole point and see what they are doing i mean uh, for example this uh, this friend of yours uh, that particular eyesight issue it has to be something to do with the retinal layer which is the the sensitive layer which gives us vision at the back of the eye you know what they do in ayurveda to treat eye disorders they'll create a dam like yeah, thing yeah. they'll put an oil and they'll do the massage yeah I've they'll do that. all that yeah they'll do leg massage they'll massage yeah. here and all yeah. and then they'll make from maida and all they'll make some uh, like beavers create a dam they'll make that on your face and then they'll pull put some stuff in it and yeah. they'll keep you that's not as natra basti yeah so they they, they they do that stuff how does something outside your eye improve something so much deep inside your eye your eye won't absorb it right it's it's not possible and you're closing your eyes and keeping because you can't open your eyes right how does it reach the innermost layer of the eye it's impossible so those stuff if you know that this this is the stuff that that they're doing for example they do leech therapy for diabetes you know i i yeah, the guys do yeah, yeah so to improve sugars and control sugars they'll put leeches all over your face and all that how does a leech take care of your <laughs> glycemic <laughs> status right? yeah it's crazy so i mean when you know that the practice itself is illogical a little bit of conclusions can be made there only see uh, uh, we were discussing right you are also a um, teacher now uh, and um, uh the the school and the platform what you chosen is twitter right you have a very different um, demeanor there a different identity there uh which you have in your own confession which is very ruthless very harsh right uh, one is a monologue where you're teaching second is when someone is responding to you you would have a way to react but then when you go back to your original identity which is a doctor where you are expected to be calm mindful right how do you balance between both these two identities because to me it looks very like pole apart no situational right so in my real work that i do i mean twitter is a very small part of what i do 
in my real work what i do i deal with people with sickness and illness and compassion empathy comes first there and it comes automatically because i i have been trained to be compassionate and i am inherently empathetic to people right so because i am in that profession and that comes automatically and on twitter it's it's the situations are totally different it's either you respond to something totally rubbish or you respond to something that is a genuine question and you don't have to be compassionate or or or, or empathetic or ethical and all that in that you just deal with that for that particular moment and move on to the other one and i have found out that initially when i used to be on twitter in, i mean i was very much into twitter from 2019 mid onwards right so initially what i used to do was i used to answer to all the responses and i used to get into street fights and uh, you know it was just bad it was chaotic at that time and i figured out that uh, this is not the way to teach so you teach very sharp very fine and focused and you take and you choose your battles well so you choose particular conversations which where you can turn that into a teaching so there will be some guy who's abusing you and you abuse back you get an abuse back you abuse again so that becomes an abusive conversation only nothing nothing comes out of it but there is a guy who abuses you but then gives an extra angle to the conversation about something which is misinformation so you forget that abuse part and you take that up that misinform misinformation part and then teach on that right so that abuse gets completely completely down at the at the bottom and then the whole aspect of teaching comes there because you have you are now focused on that misinformation angle so that guy cannot abuse you anymore because people will learn from that misinformation and this is how i have changed my method of teaching on twitter from what i was before to what i am now even now i mean i don't abuse abuse the way they they do i am harsh and i am very critical i am sarcastic and it might mean it, it's very rude. i mean i'm yeah. I, i'm sorry but i know that it, it is mean and sarcastic <laughs> i i do that purposefully intentionally sometimes i do i it's unintentional but sometimes it just comes out like that but uh, most of the times i do a little bit of humor, humorous uh, sarcasm it might feel bad for the other person but there is some some kind of learning in it yes yeah, so so teaching has different colors right um, uh, so uh, i was reading who recently said that infodemic is possibly the biggest epidemic of 21st century where a lot of misinformation is happening now this sort of teaching uh, and i don't mean you i mean infodemic is people who are putting information which would be misinformation right it's coming with uh, uh, again self proclaimed experts uh, there is a word to it called health influencers mm -hmm. it's becoming extremely hard for a layman to understand who is expert who is not right some has a vested interest because like we said in the beginning they have something to sell so they would kind of call out the problem and say hey by the way if you want something go click on the link above and mm -hmm. i might have a product for you to get solved some might not have their own product but might have someone else product which they might endorse say that i might be yeah, hey yeah, you know yeah. abc is a product uh, which i feel is good for you but i'm not saying you should take but i think it should be mm -hmm. good for you mm -hmm. because i have taken but by the way i am talking something else so they are all kind of experts today yeah. right how does a layman because you are now taking teaching seriously how does a layman differentiate and authenticate who is a right expert who is not so i i think it's better discussed from an example point of view um so there is this uh, very very famous who heavily followed handle uh, of dr david sinclair dr david sinclair i'm yeah. sure you know about sure. him yeah. he's a anti aging anti aging guy. yeah so david sinclair is actually a basic scientist yeah. he's not a clinician and he talks a lot about how you can reverse your aging with a host of supplements that uh, he has worked on yeah. and also a lot of other groups have worked Now on he has his own company who is doing that yeah, yeah. so uh, there is this there is this particular compound called resveratrol yeah. where uh, he brings out a lot of data saying that that actually improves your uh, capacity to uh, reverse aging and things like that now from the basic science point of view he is perfectly right because studies have shown all of that it might have it might upregulate or downregulate some set of genes asso associated with aging it might downregulate some um, inflammatory markers what not i mean that that's all in the lab it's all good it's all on the tissues and cells and everything now the problem comes when he starts extrapolating that directly into the humans when there is actually no evidence on it so when if you look back at decades research on resveratrol you can see that all of those research was fraudulent and it was done by an indian guy and there is absolutely no evidence that this particular compound does anything for you beneficial but he holds on to that that is because he is a basic scientist and he is not a clinical scientist so you have to know that whatever he is speaking from uh, from his own terms 
is based on basic science data and nothing about human data. So he is a basic scientist, consider him one. So he, when he gives you something, some advice on health or you should take this or you should take that, take it with a pinch of salt because he has no idea about what he is talking about. Same thing to do with Huberman. <laughs> Andrew Huberman, beautiful, there is a video on, on office on alcohol and how it affects the brain. He is a neurobiologist, perfectly done video. But then he says that, you know, take, take Ashwagandha, that will improve your cognition and whatever. He is talking from complete ignorance. So if, if I have to follow that particular uh, advice that they give about Ashwagandha or about uh, some anti-aging, I would look at somebody who is actually working on it from the human perspective. That is a, a, a geriatric specialist or a, or a, a sports specialist or, or a sleep specialist. So if a sleep specialist who has good clinical research backing him up or, or is or, or, or an authority on sleep medicine tells me that ashwagandha is actually good for your sleep and cognition or whatnot and here here are the clinical research based on this level of evidence. So level 1 is the best, level 2, level 3, level 4, level 5, whatever evidence they can show. Then I would take that as the right expertise where I can take that information from. But if you take that from people who are, I mean they are authorities in their own way yeah. but they are not authorities in in a wholesome manner. So I don't talk about, uh, uh, you know, kidney health and uh, obstetrics and gynecology and, you know, how to take care of your, uh, uh, you know, your uterus health and all that. I mean, I, I don't know anything about it. I'm, I'm a doctor. I have, I have done a lot of research work. I have, I have close to 216 publications now. Yeah. And uh, why not, why can't I talk about it? Right. But I don't talk about it because I, I, I know nothing about it. So the same way, you should know which person is talking about what his credentials are on that subject and within that credential, what his expertise is on giving advice because both these guys, Huberman and uh, Sinclair, they don't see any patients. Yeah. They have no ex exposure to patients. So how can they, and they have no publications on actual patients, level 1, level 2 evidences on any of these. So how can you take their uh, advice as uh, rightful? So this is this is important for people to understand. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting point, but I'm also trying to, so, you know, I also follow Huberman, Sinclair, Peter Etia, all of those guys. Uh, uh, you know, doesn't it go back and connect to your point to say that uh, they have their own expertise, but they're also evolving and maybe they may be also becoming curious in other topics. But you're right, they may not be practicing doctors, they're not clinic clinicians and they're not uh, seeing patients. But do you think somewhere that reference to the research can give them perhaps not the authority, but some inference to say that, look, I have read this or I have spoken to an expert and therefore I feel co in being correlation. For example, Huberman talks a lot about cold exposure. He talks a lot about, um, uh, uh, of course, of uh, ashwagandha, protein. And mm. these are uh, these are not what perhaps his uh, full-time job is. He's a neuroscientist, yeah. right? But does referencing other uh, research article give you that uh, authority? So referencing has to be wholesome, should not be cherry picked. And the referencing has to be based on clinical levels of levels of evidence. So you have level 1, level 2, level 3, and level 5 which is the uh, lowest. Talk from that point of view, that makes it credible. Right, for example, see I'm, I'm saying that uh, yoga does not cause weight loss. Right, so there, there are no studies to actually prove from level 1 and level 2 evidence that it does not. There, is, there are no studies done. But definitely there are studies to prove that yoga can improve your balance, your postures, uh, your flexibility. All of that is there. So I will not say that yoga is absolutely useless. I will say that yoga is useless for this set of things, but it is useful for this set of things. Similarly, they have to follow that kind of a wholesome uh, picture when it comes to referencing. So what they do is, they'll just reference things that fit with their narrative. Like this showed that, you know, this is going good and this showed that this is going good. But when they, when we look at human studies on it, there might be nothing on it. So they won't talk about it. So that is where this, this problem happens. Because if they talk about that, then they cannot sell their supplements. I've seen one uh, trend uh, off late in the past year or so, uh, where almost everyone is referencing a PubMed article, oh, right? It's just it's becoming crazy, a superpower, yeah. right? Almost everyone is uh, referring and I find it as much hard for a layman to go out and interpret. So do you think putting something on PubMed is a validation of the genuinity or efficacy of their research or, I mean, that's one question. And I also want you to tell how can or should a layman make an attempt to interpret what's there on PubMed as a research paper? 
yeah so this is the brandolnis law right the energy that is required to refute uh, misinformation yeah. is much higher in magnitude than what it was used to create it so i'll say that uh, turmeric is not useful classic example on twitter right i'll say turmeric is not useful for anything there are no clinical benefits to t- turmeric it is ingesting uh, consuming turmeric as a medicine not as in the diet i'm talking about medicine supplements and uh, no clinical societies recommend turmeric for any uh, particular disease condition suddenly i get a pubmed uh, post which says that uh, the title will be uh, benefits of turmeric and it will be like a five page review now it's there i mean that it's an article and it's there benefits of turmeric is written there but the person who has posted it does not understand that that is a narrative review narrative review means it's the opinion of the others okay. based on the lowest level of evidence so if somebody gives me puts a pubmed article saying that turmeric clinical benefits in this and this disease a systematic review and meta analysis that i will look at because that is the highest level of evidence meta analysis if somebody tells me an umbrella review of umbrella review means it is analysis of all those meta analysis which is even a much more better level of evidence so that will make me sit up but that doesn't happen because people will just look at the title and they'll just just put it under yours so just because you have a pubmed title doesn't mean that it is credible or it is uh, positive for your your argument it means that you just know how to search and copy paste that's it nothing more and the more ai tools that. make it much more easier these days yeah and and it's so difficult for us to i mean for me to go down there and write that this is a narrative review this other clinical level that, that that's exactly the brand only's principle i'm wasting so much of energy trying to refute bullshit over bullshit right so this happens with pubmed searches but so how do you so what do you think can be a layman's uh super power here right? if a layman wants to make an attempt and we spoke about scientific temperament someone in his late 30s 40s now believe that they have an ability to go out and read because it's in english right uh, what signals they should see like you said there could be a meta analysis there could be umbrella analysis but that's coming from a degree of um, credential and education what you have gone through in 16 20 years right yeah so for a general person uh, should they be referring to pubmeds or should they not be uh, and if they should be what are the uh, you know filters they should be looking and how they should be interpreting so i mean from a complete layman point of view they should not be even getting on pubmed okay that's not for them so pubmed is basically uh, a research uh, repository it's not the it's not a publication per se or a journal per se it's a collection of a lot of journals and publications and uh, you 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 can actually see a lot of absolute absurd publications on pubmed right so there was this uh, publication on uh, prayer in the icu so they it's very very funny and interesting PubMed? yeah this it's on pubmed so what they did was a group of patients after cardiac surgery in the icu uh, they did uh, intercessional prayers for them to see that they improve better and another group they did not pray for them the group so ideally the hypothesis was when you pray for a group of people they would get better faster and uh, the other group they would not but exactly opposite happened because they were in the icu and people were actually praying for them they thought they were going to die faster the patients right so they had a longer stay in the icu because of that and the others got out of the icu faster for whom the prayers were not done so you, you get actual total uh, nonsense studies like that on pubmed right and pubmed is not something that is your benchmark for any argument uh, the benchmark for arguments is correct scientific methodology based validated uh, clinical evidence and that i don't think a normal person or a lay person or a non medical person can just get that off one fine day because i struggled through 16 years of my life to get there and it's not that easy so if somebody has to know or understand about what the best option for a particular healthcare or a preventive or a treatment as- aspect is i'm sh- i i i urge them to speak with their primary care physician i'm sure they will have a family physician a real doctor by the way not alternative practitioners uh, or a primary care physician or or a specialist who will be part of their uh, you know family care and that is the way to go forward and not just go on to pubmed and you know latch on it so is it also uh, again extension to is it because it's just so easy for anyone to go out and publish something and therefore claim and put a link on their bio that i have a pubmed uh, reference uh is is it that easy and therefore you know this chaos no, ha- half the people i mean no, more than half the people who put up a link 
don't know what the link actually contains because they'll just read either the abstract or yeah. most of them actually only read the title right yeah. and they'll see uh, the title is randomized trial and uh, they and they think that's the best evidence because some of the randomized trials are actually very poorly done trials because they have very bad methodology of uh, you know randomizing those patients and lot of confounders in it so these things people may not be able to understand easy and just putting up a link does not with a with, with a very nice flory uh, floral pretty title Uh, doesn't make it actually a good uh, argument for anything and i don't think people should do that because it's one it's very difficult to it's a waste of time trying to convince them it is not good and second it's it's very annoying yeah one observation which i've had it is also kind of a you know a pet peeve for me is that um there isn't enough clinical trials which are done on indians as a subject or topic uh, uh which talks about nutritional um, habits right i mean most of the references what Yeah. we refer is mostly uh, americans europeans or certain ethnic groups which are not relatable i mean our diets our physiology our metabolism is very different right yeah yeah i mean i mean this is true i mean uh, it, for, first of all it's not not easy to conduct a nut- trial based on nutrition because it's a lot of things that you have to take care of before you standardize that protocol and uh, when it comes to the indian uh, population every place has a different yeah. kind of approach to nutrition i mean diet yeah. like for example take take within kerala itself kottayam has one yeah. kochi has one of course malappuram has another one right so it's so different so it's not easy to run trials that way in in india but we do have a lot of fantastic observational both retrospective and prospective uh, work done on nutrition in, in in indian population and from where we have identified a lot of Uh, deficiencies in nutrition and uh, the icmr and national institute of nutrition they have all brought out a lot of good guidelines for nutrition among indians based on that uh, regarding specific interventions dietary interventions it's easier to do that in a western population because they can easily stratify them and and uh, uh, make it possible for example there is an atkins diet or a dash diet or a keto diet it's easier to run that kind of protocols in the west because uh, it's one thing is there is huge funding there's a huge group that will take care of it uh, we don't have both we don't have people committed to research uh, in nutritional research in india and not not many and funding is another big big problem a lot of people can actually uh, you know there's a lot of uh, fallout um, they don't we, we, we they, they can't touch the particular sample size or whatever during the course of that uh, intervention and all that lot of problems in india but still we do good Uh, when so it comes to observation so, studies so therefore it would mean that it's uh, it's unfair to compare someone who's trying to understand whether i should take a protein before a workout or a carb before a workout or should i take coffee after sleep or before sleep and yeah. then reference to something which has been uh, put by an american scientist uh, on american cohorts or a european cohort it's it's an unfair comparison then um, to some extent some interventions are unfair uh, for example if i want to take uh, about coffee most of the coffee studies are done in european population and in the us and uh, it's all about and the the best coffees that they talk about are black coffees without sugar and yeah. i don't think a lot of indians drink black coffee without sugar i mean a yeah. lot of places have more of chai tea uh, down south it is coffee but i don't think it's sugarless yeah. and it's very difficult for people to go into that particular practice of doing that and that has definitely good evidence to it i mean a lot of good studies have been done on it based on prospective observations because we don't have observations on that doesn't mean that we don't we don't have to try it so it depends on the person now like i i don't want to try green tea because i've tried it and it tastes horrid it was horrible experience for me so i don't like it i like coffee and i like coffee without sugar also i, I can i can do with it so ultimately when it comes to nutrition or a particular diet intervention i think people need to identify what is good for them or what they can tolerate for a longer duration not not because some guy in the us told you this is good or some guy in bombay told you that this is bad that doesn't mean that you have to follow that what is good for you you have to try that and what what you can stick with that is what is important yeah. so i want to quote something which you had written in one of the articles you said uh, i you know quote begins clinical medicine is not just about diagnosing and prescribing medications uh, even artificial intelligence chatbots can do that but something that artificial intelligence chatbots cannot do is connect with the patient Uh, clinical medicine should not be programmed it must be fluidic and embrace the person not the situation in a situation like india where we spoke where the doctor ratio is so skewed and we were talking about how the traditional alternative medicine 
uh, their superpower perhaps is to spend that emotional connect which a modern medicine uh, practitioner cannot do how do you think this um, uh, narrative or this outlook pans out in modern medicine this is i mean this is a very relevant question but for one which there is no actual answer to because the whole aspect of patient uh, doctor ratio the skew the skewness the whole aspect of spending time with the patients to connect more and then provide uh, treatment uh, all of that may not be practically applicable for everyone right so the whole aspect of doctor patient ratio does not uh, the burden is not on the doctors it's on the regulatory system it's on the the health framework from the top it has to come down better itself but what doctors can do is that see i i spend almost 40 45 minutes with a new patient because i can afford to do that but uh, somebody who's seeing 200 patients in a day in the opd cannot do that but there is the the it's it's all about uh, how you are approaching that patient or talking to that patient even if it's one sentence or two sentences you have to have kindness so somebody comes and tells me uh, i have headache fever uh, vomiting so i said okay take these three drugs these four drugs go come back after one week but instead of that i tell him that uh, don't worry it will get over maybe it's a seasonal fever you should get better please take these three drugs if there is any issue please call the hospital this is the line and let me know if there are no issues please come back after seven days after completing the course see the difference lies there see i i was not very empathetic or compared not spent uh one hour with that patient but the few minutes where i changed the words from what he wants to hear to what i want to finish off with it, it differs so somebody can just talk to the patient and finish off that job or somebody can be dutiful a doctor can be dutiful to that patient and do it the way they want i mean they're not they're not here as your um, clients or customers they are here so that you are responsible for them and you have to uh, give them the added benefit of compassion and care not just the treatment so i think this every doctor can do if even if that particular doctor is very busy two or three lines word it the right way is compassion enough that's also i mean that would also be possible because that's how again going back to the education system that 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 if that was an ingrained fabric in the education system of the doctor that there is a soft side of it and then the technical side of it and because we said that uh, the doctor is overburdened right yeah. and that's where this uh, uh, over explosion of ai role is today because yeah. the ai the introduction of ai in healthcare is largely that let the doctor retain their you know precious time in doing the high quality work which is opinionating and surgi- surgical uh, mm-hmm. you know recommendations and the lower end work which you said someone randomly comes and he may not even have something which is very uh concerning but he wants that time and attention can be perhaps done by ai because ai chatbots will do that so now do you think <clears throat> extension to the fact that ai has a role to it the doctor has a role to it but doctor has something additional what doctor should do which is the emotional connect do you think that ai uh is of any usefulness in the healthcare sector is there a play to it in the long term because we know in a population like india uh suddenly we can't have a 3 to 4x surge in our doctor population it probably would have a you know little growth to it but the population is growing uh, so i i think before we jump to the ai part of it there is there are there is a lot that we can do in between so for example like you said uh, a, a super specialist like me uh, i can spend a lot more quality time with complex patients guiding them about complex decisions right i don't have to uh, uh, see a lot of patients with just Uh, run of the mill fatty liver who does not need any treatment they just need some advice and stuff like that and they can change their lifestyle i don't need to spend time on that i mean if you look at from my super specialist point of view that anybody can do that any any uh, at any level a doctor can do that mbbs md or dm now there is a group of doctors known as family medicine practitioners right i think they are a, they are a complete underdog level of population of doctors that we have in our community now and they are the generalist they are the ones who can shoulder what ai can do so they it should start with them they it should start with the general practitioner who will filter out all of this in a compassionate and ethical and a focused manner and they can take care of a lot of these patient burden which can be easily taken care of at that level and then filter it down up so there is a patient who has fatty liver he needs only lifestyle change he can advise and then he can go 
now he sees that that person with fatty liver has got an abnormal liver function test so he advises more tests and then he sees that there is a tumor sitting there that he cannot so he will filter that patient to me and i can take care of it in the right way why do you need ai you know I, you don't need i mean there is there can be a role of ai uh, especially as an augmentation to what uh, skill doctors do for example endoscopy or reading a complex radiography or a particular report or a, you know there's huge data that is coming in from multiple patients and you need to know what is specific to that especially in clinical research point of view ai can help you in that but i don't think a doctor should ever replace or ai should ever replace a doctor in seeing a patient at the outset i, I don't think that's a good idea what do you think uh, can be added to the medical education system today uh to create doctors what you think what you said are missing i mean i think there, there, there should be a course on patient communication there has to be and that has to start by thing from the second year of mbbs where now the new uh, guidelines have come that they the, the student i mean when i was doing mbbs my first clinical exposure was when i, I reached fourth year or fifth year something like that and more 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 so into internship during that time we were never seeing so many patients right and this has this is going to change now where there will be a lot of clinical exposure from the new program so there should be i think at least a year of teaching on patient communication and patient skills because a lot of violence against doctors that happens in the country now especially in the south and north uh, most more so in the north is because of miscommunication it's not because the doc- the people want to beat the doctor up it's not because they see him as a villain the first it's because he's he's become that in their eyes because of some issue somewhere down the line and that is mostly to do with miscommunication and this has happened to me too i had i had uh, a group of patients thrash my opd right left and center destroy my uh, this was in 2016 when i started practicing when i was slightly more naive and uh, i was not very empathetic or compassionate the way i had to be and i missed out on communicating few things to them and uh, because of that they were really angry at me and they came and destroyed my op so when i uh, and it I, i i they were nearly violent towards me but then the security came and i was not physically hit otherwise they would have thrashed me also i think uh, but they just destroyed the the furniture and left and i look back at that and i uh, to to because nobody has ever behaved to me like that before right so everything was going well suddenly this happened so i reflected back and i i figured out that there was a series of uh, uh messaging that was done uh, this pers- this patient is this particular uh, his son was the one who came and thrashed the opd so he came to me and he they were living very far away and he was messaging about his father's condition so his father is very sick and uh, he is going to die and i know that he knows it and uh, he messages me saying that now he is uh going into this now he's going into this so initially i was responding uh, so this is what is expected so hang on hold on things like that after some point it became annoying for me at that time right so because i have a lot more other patients to take care of this guy is going to die anyway why should i bother right and he is not near me he is somewhere else under palliative care so why should i be bothered about it that was my thinking at that time and i i never had i mean i never thought the other way and i stopped messaging him i mean i stopped replying and uh at the end when his father died uh, he messaged me saying that my dad has died and all that and um, i did not uh, reply to that also so uh, I, nothing i mean i was just like you know this robot ai bot you would call it sitting there doing nothing uh, after a few weeks after all the funeral everything is done this guy comes with his two cousins to my op and uh, he has found out that uh, at some point Uh, i did a mistake i mean i never did a mistake but this is what i mean because they wanted to get at me they have cherry picked a particular instant where they felt that i did not do something better for him but that deficiency was not during that time it was actually during this messaging time right so he is constructed it the way that you know to approach me uh, during the time when he was admitted uh, that time you did not give him albumin injection Uh, because of which he became sicker and things like he, he did not get sick because of that he became sick because of his progression of the disease only and based on that they started uh, all the all that you know temper tantrums everything that happened so but if i was more compassionate and more forthcoming or more um, approachable at that time and i messaged maybe at least a word a couple of words to him saying that please hold on i'm sorry whatever 
it this would not have happened right so there was a miscommunication there between him and me because of which i became a villain even though i did everything i could for that patient so i don't do that anymore anybody who messages me 11 to 12 at night 11 a pm to 12 am at the night i go back when i when i finish my clinical research work writing putting my kids to bed everything i sit back i take about half an hour see all the messages that has come from morning from all the patients from all corners there might be it might be 5 per day it might be 50 per day but i respond with at least a line what not some require only compassionate care some may require a change in advice i do that for an hour and i go to sleep because my next day is peaceful then and i'm satisfied so is that why uh, again another quote which you said an empathetic and an astute doctor is far more impressive than just an astute doctor yes because uh, have you ever uh, heard a news where uh, you have uh, seen on the in the papers that a homeopathy clinic has been destroyed damaged or ayurvedic clinic has been uh, damaged and destroyed by uh, yeah. by patient by stranger i have never heard about it there is no news like that that such a news does not exist why first of all alternative medicine practitioners are not real doctors they are giving them some hokums right but they never get belted by the by the public or the patients why because they are very empathetic i mean they are doing i mean i i don't agree with any of the treatments but they they put their hands on their shoulders and they listen and they talk because they have no scientific evidence and no science to apply they apply a lot of human hours on the, on the patients so they'll convince them they will care for them they will talk to them they will cry with them they'll do all that and the empathy there outshines the lack of science so imagine if you have science with empathy so maybe maybe but then would you agree maybe that's what modern medicine scientific evidence should uh, take a cue from this that uh, take patient communication and include in their uh, I have curriculum about it i have written in my newsletter in morning context i have written there is a title what ayurveds what modern medicine doctor should learn from ayurveds and homeopathy yeah, title yeah. of i that. read about that yes yeah, i have written exactly this that's what they should learn yeah yeah the way you have to talk to the patient it may takes care of a lot of things yeah and it's therapeutic also all right so uh, we had to take a break uh, both of us seems to be energized now uh, i think this probably would be the most sought after section uh, like i said in the beginning um, it's more about the faqs uh, because we live in a world where everyone needs a shortcut everyone needs mm-hmm. a short answer to their pain problem so when i put it on social media that we are going to talk Yeah. uh the most common questions uh, i could see i tried to collate it but it was also uh, which i also wanted to check with you because there was a lot of debunking and misinformation uh, uh there was a lot of misinformation and i thought from your perspective from your lens because you're looking from a clinical perspective uh it's good to understand what is right and what is wrong right so right. so first thing um, alcohol right uh, mm-hmm. i know it's 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 a favorite <coughs> speculated contemplated <coughs> topic uh now weirdly when you google search uh and when you're trying to type search the most common keyword is benefits of alcohol yeah right and when you put that uh the first article is harvard health which says moderate alcohol is okay and it's got it got some health benefits yeah. then is a mayo clinic uh article which says that some bit of alcohol is good then who says no alcohol Uh, is good what's your take yeah. <clears throat> so this this depends on how you want to fit your narrative in right so um, i mean let, let's let's just look at evidences from all three so initially when there were a lot of studies on alcohol and uh, there was this very famous j shaped curve which ideally meant that you know at some particular dose of alcohol there was some health benefits and that was mostly to do with heart health so the chances of getting uh, a cardiac uh, a, a myocardial infarction or a, a, a heart attack these things were actually lower with uh, ischemic heart disease was actually lower with that particular dose of alcohol so some amount of alcohol in moderation is good so this was a narrative for a long long time now when lot of new studies came in looking at more and more uh, effects on the body with alcohol not just the heart the picture has changed so it's it's like do you want to have that single benefit at the cost of so many other issues around it so is that risk worth taking so in in one line no it is not okay that is why no amount of al- no amount of alcohol is safe a single exp- exposure to alcohol itself has been found to be 
adverse to human health a single exposure i'm not talking about uh, normal drink i mean continuous drinkers or occasional drinkers or i'm just talking about a single exposure to alcohol it increases your chances of developing cancers the biggest problem is with alcohol is actually cancer so it increases the risk of multiple cancers from stomach cancer to esophageal cancer to breast cancer so do you want to put yourself in that position just because you feel that little bit of alcohol is good for your heart so your heart might be beating properly you'll be you'll have a healthy heart but you'll be alive to realize that you're dying of other things yeah right so the whole aspect now comes to risk versus benefit so why the who and also the lancet paper that made who make that statement said that is that because any amount of alcohol can increase risk of so many other diseases uh the safe level of alcohol does not exist so even in my conclusion there is no safe level of alcohol because alcohol is not a food it's not part of your daily uh, essential food item it's a very well known social poison and the body does not use alcohol that uh, for its for for any benefits for example if you drink alcohol your liver wants to get it out of your system right it's not going to store there and make good use of it so why do you want to consume such a thing so the whole the whole uh, idea that alcohol is unsafe or any amount is unsafe is because it has no food value it has no nutritive value and the moment you put it inside your body the body wants to take it out so your body is signaling that it wants it out so why do you want to put more in okay now uh, i mean i'm tempted to ask how do you define alcohol is it any type of alcohol because now you have beer you have wine you have hard liquor now when you generalize does any of that uh is all of that is harmful or is there still a room for a uh, occasional beer or occasional wine to go inside yeah you? so this reminds me of one of my patients i recently met uh and i asked him that uh, when was the last time you drank alcohol so he said that sir i have stopped drinking alcohol uh so i said that's pretty good because a whole month he is not drank so his wife said no sir he is drinking vodka so i said why are you lying to me He said, "Sir, I was drinking hard, dark colored rum all this while, and I have shifted to vodka. Vodka is clearer, so there is lesser alcohol in it, <laughs> right? So that is his thinking. Right. So when when we talk about alcohol, it's everything is ethanol. So the content of ethanol is what differentiate different spirits. So you'll have uh, hard liquor, which will be like forty to forty two percent of vo- volume by volume ethanol. You'll have beer, which may contain anywhere from, uh, depending on how it is made, from anywhere from three percent to eight uh, to ten percent." you'll have wine or fortified wine which is somewhere around 8% to 13%. So alcohol is ethanol. All of this stuff contains ethanol and in different fractions and different proportions. So everything is alcohol. It's not like your beer is safer and wine is safer. It still contains ethanol. Okay, cool. Alcohol is done. Second favorite drink, coffee. What's your take on coffee? So I'm I I might be a bit, bit biased regarding coffee. I mean not because uh, I don't I, not because other drinks are not useful but in the sense that tea and all that there are, I know there are child lovers there. But coffee has a lot of uh, studies done on it. So it's it's not first of all let me make this statement that uh, these studies are not the level of studies that we we look at at from a very Uh, extreme validated point of view because it's not easy to do nutrition studies because i like we describe i mean we discussed before there are a lot of confounders yeah. and it's not easy but we have lot of good prospective observation studies which suggest that uh, drinking coffee especially black coffee without sugar a minimum of 3 cups a day so 3 cups can be anywhere between depending on your us and your in indian measurements yeah. I, i would i would say that a good measure is somewhere about 100 to 150 ml per day mm-hmm. that is each cup uh has its own great benefits on heart health on the liver on the brain um and also it prevents a lot of liver related events for example in patients who have fatty liver disease it improves or reduces progression of fatty liver uh, into becoming chronic liver disease in patients with chronic liver disease it prevents or reduces the risk of getting liver cancers and so many so many good stuff about coffee so coffee is the go to drink for me and uh, there is a lot of myth regarding coffee that you know if you consume coffee or take more amounts of coffee about 4 or 5 cups a day it increases your blood pressure even this is a myth a uh, new study has shown that it does not increase your chances of uh, high blood pressure or strokes or anything like that uh, some people get uh, slightly uneasy with coffee because of the caffeine content 
so the ideal way is to not drink anything beyond late night in late evening okay. so i i have my last cup somewhere around 5 pm i don't drink coffee beyond 6 pm and uh, i usually start off with a fresh cup of coffee in the morning and then space it out about 3 or 4 cups during the day till early evening and this does not harm you in any way i mean if you stick to 3 to 4 cups of coffee it's very very beneficial and uh i have to disclose that i have no funds or stocks in coffee companies <laughs> no so that's interesting you know the disclaimer is useful so you know one thing i want to double click is a is that yes this point you said that there has to be a uh window time uh in advance to your sleep uh, where it can i mean uh, it can di- uh, be an intervention to your sleep yes, right so yes. that one and second i've also read a lot that it can be um, also an energy uh booster right i mean if you have it early yeah. in the morning or yeah. pre workout you do yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's a caffeine yeah. that's that's taking care of it so the whole aspect of coffee being beneficial for health is not because of caffeine yeah uh so you can have the same benefit with decaf also that's because there are coffee specific polyenols which are specific plant compounds in the coffee that gives you that benefit yeah. so decaf is also fine yeah excellent uh now uh, coffee uh, coffee with sugar coffee without sugar so therefore sugar right now sugar again a very big topic uh, specifically artificial sugar now you have uh, the artificial sweeteners now you have monk fruit you have jaggery what's the general thesis is all similar to refined sugar or there are any good bad sugar around that so the bad sugar that we talk about is white sugar which is refined sugar and uh, people think that the other forms of sugar I mean, I'm not talking about artificial. I'm talking about natural. There, there is refined sugar. There is jaggery. Jaggery. There yeah. is honey, which yeah. is also used as a sugar substitute. Uh, then there is um, uh, raw forms of sugar, like cane sugar. These are all actually sugar. You know, it's it's all the same, and it it's not like honey or jaggery is more healthier than refined sugar because they all contain the same amount or almost equal or slightly more amount of calories per hundred grams. If you look at it. now the whole aspect is to use it in moderation so because honey is so sweet you don't need large amounts of honey to give you that particular sweetness so you tend to use it less up which makes it a healthier option because you don't consume too much now if you look at uh, jaggery it's much less sweeter than your refined sugar so people tend to put more jaggery in to get that sweetness which defeats the purpose because then it becomes as good as your refined sugar so the whole uh, myth about uh natural sugars and within natural sugars refined sugar uh is less i mean more adverse events versus the other unrefined versions which are healthier is also wrong because okay. everything is ultimately sugar sugar it's either sucrose or yeah. uh, like fructose or glucose in various forms yeah now coming to artificial sweeteners uh, which are sugar substitutes they are perfectly safe I mean, there are a lot of studies which will tell you that it can cause cancers, or they'll damage your DNA, or they can cause strokes, strokes, or heart attacks and stuff like that. But the bottom line is that most of these studies were done in supraphysiological doses. For example, that they are not the amounts that we consume, or recommend, or or recommended doses that we consume daily. They are very high doses, and these studies have been done on tissues or cell cultures. or cell based systems where they have found out that it changes the dna or causes some mutagenic changes at very high doses like 300 to 3000 3000 times higher doses we don't consume that much the general guideline from any nutritional society including the us fda uh, or uh, the health regulatory societies in italy or you take uk or or on the europe in the eu they they don't mention that you know you some you should stop taking sweetness artificial sweetness they mentioned that you can use it in moderation and most of these artificial sweeteners are safe none of them can cause cancers uh, in the long term because we have no evidence for the same great uh, so uh, a common uh, i don't know whether this is a, again a cultural nuance but uh, in the recent times there has been um, a kind of a spectrum or a chronology on how you should eat uh now th- th- it's called a nutritional protocol right or your or your diet protocol that you start with uh, a fiber uh, you know then get your proteins then last you get your carbs so what's your take on that chronology does it i mean is there any scientific evidence that doing following that chronology is adding any benefits or is just another placebo effect yeah, i mean the moment food gets into your body it just does what it has to do right so it doesn't wait for fiber to come in first uh, carbohydrate to come in first or protein to come in first you give it protein it will it will metabolize and digest protein the way it has to you 
make it make protein give it protein first or give protein last it'll it'll do the same thing with it and even with fiber or even with carbohydrates or fats it does the same so i don't think chronology matters because the body does not is not uh, you know programmed like a robot to follow the chronology because i have i mean i have a co- cup of coffee in the morning i feel like having some idlis for breakfast i have it the next day i feel like having something else for breakfast maybe a multigrain bread so that doesn't change the way the body reacts to it it's going to act the same so i don't think this uh, protocol is scientific enough but but i i'm sure that there will be lot more such protocols coming up in the future yeah so uh, i mean yeah i mean protocol uh, you know reminds me that uh, we live in a time where uh, everything what we do uh, is uh, done after establishing a certain routine protocol everyone is recommending you to do a protocol for example there's a protocol for supplements uh you know whether it's multivitamins or dietary supplements uh, proteins and all of that right so because everyone we spoke about health influencers and we spoke about so called experts who are telling you to eat this and therefore you will strengthen your bones or you will have a better quality hair or you know what all all that sort right so how does one understand or create their own protocol uh what is good or bad for them whether it's a choice of a certain protein or whether it's a choice or if at all they need a protein or if they at all need a certain multivitamin how does a layman figure it out um see in, in, in i mean basically to when we talk about diet so i think the first aspect is to know that nothing beats a balanced diet so there are there are recommendations and definitions of what a balanced diet is it's as simple as that it's it's up on the web it's given by uh, every country has their own balanced diet protocols the indian government has given it the national institute of nutrition has it on their website the icmr has it on the website so when you look at that protocol and include those kind of for example they'll say that this much of proportion of the diet should contain carbs this much should contain protein this much should contain fiber and this is how you can get it so they'll give you proportion of food and they'll give you proportion of uh, the nutrition that you're going to get from that food so if you can follow that that's it because that's a da- well balanced diet and th- that will take care of all your macro and micro needs for the body but then certain we have cu- cultures and we have certain traditions we have uh, diet is also uh, you know it is affected by religious beliefs and everything so the i mean take the case of vegetarians so there are vegetarians who uh, they are on a fully plant based diet some of them may or may not have dairy but in vegetarians we definitely will have vitamin b12 deficiency because that does that yeah. does not come with the plant source vitamin b12 can come from a uh, plankton source that is algae and all that but it it's it's not cheap it's very expensive to buy them and have have seaweed and algae and everything so to to for them addition of supplements is justified so you can have a vitamin b12 supplementation similarly for uh, somebody is following a vegan pattern of diet they don't take any dairy and they don't have any animal products for that matter which means that they will be deficient in vitamin b12 they can be deficient in vitamin vitamin b calcium and so many other things so they supplement that because their diet requires them to supplement it but apart from these uh, you know changes in diet based on cultures or personal preferences i don't think any human requires a supplement so you did a very specific uh, uh, you know tweet and a project around protein and i link it to the show notes I urge you know listeners and people who are watching to go and check that tweet out because it was a very elaborate study what you did in uh, i think 30 plus odd uh, brands and studying their protein right now protein is we all know um, is probably one of the most underappreciated and also uh, we are a very protein deficient country right specifically the data says that 80% of women in india are protein deficient right and also for, because culturally you know we are a very carb intensive yeah. uh, you know yes. pilot what you got be that south or north carb is uh, more dominant right now how does one understand i mean of course when i was trying to understand what is important for me my reference point was the american uh, you know uh, society study what they did which, which said that for an so and so person with so and so weight based on their lifestyle this much of uh, you know certain gram per your body weight is what you have to do but i always wonder but that doesn't uh, is not specific to who i am like for my biology for my metabolism which is very different from how an american or a european would do right so for a typical indian how can one figure it out at whether they are protein deficient or not and how do they go about and figuring out what kind of protein they need because now you also have a lot of types of protein in the market yeah. 
um, so the amount of protein that a person requires per day has been defined in the indian population somewhere around 0.8 to 1 mg gram per kilogram per day yeah and, and this is gender agnostic yeah no yeah this is this is or across adult population okay uh, it differs when in women when they come into the pregnancy category or the lactation category so it differs there or an adult based on the disease status for example somebody has a liver disease this can go from 1 to 1.2 gram per kilogram per day so that is the only place where it differs otherwise a generally apparently healthy adult this is the standard 0.8 is what everybody requires uh, gram per kilogram per day now where do you get the protein from so if you are not i mean if you don't have any specific set uh, diet patterns you have you can have an i mean you have meats and fish and you have plants and dairy then there is not much an issue about you choosing which type of protein you want from your normal diet the issue comes when somebody is consuming a diet which is deficient in protein you know, automatically at the baseline for example a vegan diet again mm. a vegan diet is not a normal diet it's a very deficient diet so you have to supplement so in veganism uh, i mean they 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 take a lot of plants and there are protein plant protein sources but the problem is that plant proteins are not like animal proteins you know they are a lower grade animal proteins are like complete proteins even your dairy protein is a complete protein the whey protein is they are fantastic proteins they contain all essential amino acids but it's not like with plant proteins so they have but there are certain plant proteins which they can mix and match for example there is a pea protein there is a soy protein yeah. so all of this can definitely give you the amount of protein that you require in the body for it to function well now if that is not happening then they can use supplementation so a vegan can use a plant uh, protein uh, plant based protein supplement there are lots available in the market where uh, we have identified some specific brands have very good high content of protein in, in their vegan uh, proteins and uh, if you are not a vegan uh, and you are a vegetarian but you take dairy but you don't your your work is such that you are not able to uh, take enough protein uh, in your diet uh, as per recommendation then you can supplement uh with whey so whey can be whey concentrate or whey hydrosolate or whey isolate depending on your lactose intolerance and what not you can choose which is going to be suited for you now how do you def uh, define somebody who is protein deficient so this is not easy so uh see we can define someone's uh overall nutritional status using some parameters and these are clinical parameters so we have something called as uh, anthropometric measures for example we do mid arm muscle circumference measurement uh we can do uh, an imaging a ct imaging and look at the muscle volume uh, along the uh, you know the spinal area mm. and then make a calculation and in a healthy person there is a cut off in somebody who has poor muscle mass because of poor protein intake there will be a lower cut off and things like that but these are not routine mm -hmm. so the whole idea is not to i mean you don't have to check if you are protein deficient unless and until if you have a disease that makes you protein deficient for okay. example somebody has liver disease they they are bound to be protein deficient they okay. need more protein so they they can be protein deficient somebody has inflammatory bowel disease they can be protein deficient cancer patients can be protein deficient so i think only in that particular group you assess for protein deficiency status and supplement it but otherwise an apparently healthy person who without any other uh, additional fat diets going on um, a balanced diet is more than enough you don't need a supplement but in special diet populations like vegans or vegetarians if you are not able to target the protein as per the current recommended guidelines supplementing with the choice that they want uh, is enough you don't look at quality there you look at quantity for example you need to target 0.8 gram per kilogram per day whatever the source be it ha it has to be protein only and this 0.8 uh, metric gram uh, per uh, you know body weight um, does it vary depending on the lifestyle one carry and the uh, uh, essentially if if someone is extremely active let's say someone is into endurance sport vis-a-vis -vis someone who is just probably doing you know 2 km walk a day to someone who is sedentary so the metric is uh agnostic to anyone or does it vary depending on your lifestyle no it, it varies so okay. so someone who is an endurance athlete or someone who is a marathon runner they they, they we don't consider them as uh the normal yeah. apparent healthy population right they are not the general population they are extreme sports or uh, endurance trainees they would require much higher because for them uh so for example a bodybuilder or somebody who is hitting the gym every day and uh, he needs to somebody needs to lose weight and maintain lean mass 
by by losing weight he should not lose his muscles also so in maintain maintenance of lean mass in those people it has to be more so it has to be maybe 1 gram per kilogram per day instead of being 0.8 in liver disease patients it can go up to 1.2 gram per kilogram per day oh and does then, uh, then how does it i mean i know it's it's scientific and might not be very context to the conversation but when you go beyond a certain level doesn't really also intervene in your overall metabolism in some way because uh, i have noticed like for example i do endurance running and some days when i cross maybe a threshold of you know 100 grams i can feel a little discomfort my my bowel movements uh, overall i mean i started getting i start getting signs of constipation and all of that so how does a you know someone as a liver uh, someone who is suffering from some liver disease uh, how does that intervene in for them so i mean these are all uh, specific situations right okay. so you don't go some beyond what your physiological doses agree so if you go beyond that that means it's a supra physiological dose okay and you need to be doing supra physiological activity, activity. Mm. to maintain to to tolerate that dose so somebody like me who's just hitting the gym in the mornings little bit of workout you know little bit of um strength training or doing some stretches and things like that if i take 100 grams of protein per day my body won't tolerate it yeah. right so I, i'll definitely go into constipation and what not in a lot of lot of issues can happen there so that is not the right thing but if somebody who is bodybuilding who is who is working out for some championship he can easily consume 100 grams per day right. so i think even in liver disease patients the whole idea is to uh, target uh, muscle mass to prevent sarcopenia something on a sarcopenia where you lose muscle mass and we can assess it clinically and you target that and a lot of them are very frail so we have tests for frailty so and uh, the more the frail they are that means the lesser their muscle mass and strength and weakness, uh, muscle weaknesses so in those patients we can target the highest possible that is 1.2 gram per kilogram per day so uh, we spoke about balanced diet and now again that's a very subjective word because people don't know ideally what the yeah. definition of balanced diet is now uh, uh, that is also progress today where we also have intermittent fasting forms of how you structure your diet for a day so you have intermittent fasting you also have something called caloric uh, you know restricted uh, diet where you restrict your calorie intakes uh, based on what your activity is and how much you need to uh, i want you to specifically said what are the situations when one should consider these protocols whether it's intermittent fasting or when and when they should not um so i mean there there is a lot to unpack here when it comes to the types of diet that you can do so there is intermittent fasting there is calorie restriction uh, without within, within that there is very low carbohydrate yeah. and high fat there is low carbohydrate high fat there is a keto there is a paleo uh, so many things right so ultimately why do we do all of this no it's it's mostly done to lose weight so that is the first thing so you have to be overweight or obese with a lot of uh, other systemic manifestations for example uh, you might also have diabetes you might also have a hypothyroidism a low functioning thyroid you might have high blood pressure or high cholesterol levels high lipid levels so all of this put together it is very well known that when you lose weight met your metabolic health improves no no doubt about it so how to go about losing weight so you have these uh, crash weight losing uh, diets and the ones which you take up on a longer route and go for a slow and steady weight loss so the keto diet is actually a crash diet mm. so when you have to lose weight and that that happens in really morbid obese uh, people um, keto diet is what is suggested but it, keto diet is not for everyone because it's it's not an easy diet to stick on to that is why we don't have data on long term effects of keto diet because people don't continue it in the long term they they lose that at some point and uh, similarly with very low carbohydrate high fat diet it's not easy to sustain it so for a uh, for a sudden weight loss most some of the people use these kind of diets others for steady weight loss use intermittent fasting or calorie restriction it's simple calorie deficit diet so they'll have proper meals but they'll make sure that at the end of the day the amount of calories that go in is lesser than the amount of calories that is been burned by either physical activity or normal activity no uh, clinical nutritional societies recommend any of these so this is very clear so if you go 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 look at the uh, you know the european society for uh, nutrition or the uni- the us uh, nutrition clinical nutritional guidelines 
none of them will uh, specify that okay this group of patients with diabetes and obesity go for intermittent fasting or this group go for keto no they won't because these are still fat diets you know it's it's out of the normal mm-hmm. and it depends on what you want to do like for example i i i follow a type of intermittent fasting where i have an early uh, dinner then i have a breakfast and i have lots of coffee in between and uh, i can never do a keto because i it, it gives me a bad headache it gives me bad breath it's one crazy kind of a diet which i can never tolerate uh, but there are people who tolerate keto diet for longer duration so ultimately uh, if i do intermittent fasting and i get some good benefit out of it it doesn't mean that you will get the same benefits or you will be able to tolerate it so what people should do is to make an identity for themselves so it's it's for you it's for your personal uh, health right so just because some gym bro uh uh did something and now he is uh, at a position where he is now and showing off his pictures doesn't mean that that is going to work out for you yeah so i think people should realize that it's not about the type of diet that you take up will uh, pro- uh, prove to be successful it's about how you restrict your calories and increase your physical activity yeah. so there are a lot of people who don't follow any of these diets there are i mean i have a lot of patients who just do proper one hour of strength training Uh, balance training and uh, aerobics and they pro- follow a proper meal they like, they have four meals a day and they still come with weight loss that is because they ensure that the calories that they are having uh, goes into negative by the end of the day and that that is what matters most yeah. and that can be sustained and whole aim is not to lose weight in 3 months only to gain it after 6 months you have to keep at it so you follow a protocol which or a diet pattern or i mean it can be intermittent fasting or whatever that suits you but you have to make sure that you can follow it for a longer duration so this uh, entire generation of uh, diet came up because people suddenly started seeking shortcuts right i mean they have been sedentary for a long time uh, physically inactive uh, of course a lot of ultra processed junk food and now they realize okay they got to be healthy and therefore if there is a shortcut they can adapt to it yeah, so yeah. we saw a generation of uh, diets like we say a lot of fat diets and now there's a new phenomena where uh, there are certain uh, drugs which are in the market which gives you an undue advantage which is not intended one of these semiglutide yeah, right yeah, uh, yeah. ozempic right ozempic. So, right so it's meant for something else but it's giving benefit in another area right uh, yeah. and weight loss is something which is sought after for right so yeah. what's your take on that yeah so um, now the, a new uh, advisory has come that you know ozempic should not be used for weight loss so that is not the primary yeah. uh, use for ozempic it's it's something else altogether right so da- control of glycemic status. diabetes yeah diabetes so if somebody has to be on ozempic because it is for that particular approved use you don't use that for weight loss because you don't know what is going to happen in the long term with such an intervention when it was not approved for that particular intervention uh these are these are definitely shortcuts but the problem is the or the issue that i would the challenge i would say is that you don't depend upon a therapeutic agent to do the whole work for you there is a healthy way to lose weight right and that is when you put your mind to it and you follow a particular healthy balanced diet pattern along with physical activity nothing beats physical activity people think that just by cutting down on lot of food and losing that weight they are getting a good weight loss but that is a very unhealthy way of losing weight and using medications to lose weight for for exactly the particular group of patients where that is recommended yes definitely they can use obese diabetes patients can use ozempic or or the semaglutide but somebody who is not in that particular recommendation there is i mean there is no need for them to use it they have there are other healthier ways to use it because you don't know the uh, adverse events that are going to come out of it so sh- shortcuts are exactly exactly that it's short and it'll only last short it, it it won't last long so there's no longevity to it okay so uh, i think you know one of the interesting uh, pieces which also happens is when we were discussing in the previous part of this conversation was that when influencers uh tell you what is working for them and one of the instances where where elon musk uh said uh, he is taking one of such drugs i think is vigovi or ozempic which is helping uh, him for weight loss right and that's where this uh you know huge hoarding happened and people were started taking um, this particular drug right yeah. now how and i don't know if there is a right answer to it but how do we uh, how do we educate people like you said uh, you know one there could be a scientific advisory which says that you might see a short term benefit but there could be a long term harm to it yeah. but then you have this side where 
very uh, uh, you know uh, very influential people are uh, kind of professing uh, the advantage and benefits right so how do you yeah. how do we as a as a teacher how do you bring that guardrails uh, to tell people that's not that's not what you should be doing i mean i um, i think uh, this the responsibility to fight or to clarify or rectify such misinformation uh, lies on the whole uh doctor community you know the whole healthcare community and it's not just one person's uh, onus to to actually correct something like that and this does not just come from uh you know i mean such inf- misinformations can come even from doctors and i'm not i'm not saying that you know the doctor community is telling you all the r- right stuff they are also telling you a lot of wrong stuff especially with respect to nutrition very specifically to, with respect to nutrition yeah. but when it comes to using supplements or a particular intervention um i think it it is important that uh the person i mean elon musk is not a doctor i mean i don't know uh, or, or or somebody like him uh, who's an entrepreneur or or somebody in in a in a profession different than a medical profession uh, talks about a particular supplement or a medical intervention that has uh, improved a specific aspect of their health this has to be verified with your own doctor right so i mean i'm, I'm sure everybody has a doctor on their uh phone on speed dial i mean it's it's very easy to approach doctors in this country in india that's something that uh, our people are uh, i mean i think happy about uh, the the best way is to uh, reassess that particular inform- piece of information with your own doctor maybe a family doctor or your primary care physician and make sure that it it's something that you can do or it might be useful for you before jumping into uh, doing that so i i think there should be uh, different levels of checks when it comes to healthcare information it's not just one source and you're yeah. okay with it yeah. it has to be mm-hmm. one source and there are two other sources verifying that claim and from two different aspects for example um, i would i would say that if i uh, have a doubt about nutrition for example somebody comes and tells me that this new diet thing has come in and uh, they have advised me to use this particular uh product or this particular dietary intervention more uh what do you say about it so i i i may not have heard it about it at all so i i won't i won't tell that person that and I, so i'll ask him where did you hear it so he said i i saw it on this youtube channel so i when i go and look back and i see that 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 guy is not even a healthcare professional but then there is something like this that this guy is, this patient is genuinely uh concerned about so and i don't know anything about it so i ask a nutritionist or a clinical nutritionist about this do you do you know something about it and i gather that information for my patient and i i i i tell him this is the right thing to do or this is the wrong thing to do so there has to be various levels of checks and this is where critical thinking comes in which people have completely lost because they are having just one level of check and this is where things just go south i mean completely down the drain you should have multiple levels of checks that that that's what an intelligent person would do and i would definitely want everybody i mean whether you hear it from huberman or whether you hear it from sinclair or me or 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 elon musk or anybody i mean even your own uh, uh, family or friends please have different levels of checks for that information especially if it comes to healthcare this helps a lot yeah uh, so different level of checks would also mean like you said family and you know history and legacy uh, one of the common things which uh, we have been propagated in our indian culture is ashwagandha Uh, right yeah. and so much uh, in terms of its uh, benefits uh, and you have done a lot of research uh, and that's one common thing which i saw on the on our um, feed when uh, i asked what questions should i ask you ashwagandha right so what's your take it's is it good bad uh, in moderation so i think this is a very important topic at this uh, in, at this time because i just submitted for peer review publication the largest series of ashwagandha liver injury wow. in the world so that is from our group so we have a research group known as the liver research club of india where we specifically look at a lot of drug induced or specific intervention related liver injuries in among our population so this is a multi center trial multi center study uh, uh, three hospitals major hospitals have taken part in it and i i'm not going to give you a lot of details on sure. it because it's under peer review sure. but in that particular paper i am not just talking about uh, ashwagandha related liver injury i am also talking about and we have extensively and exhaustively lo- looked at all the papers on ashwagandha since last couple of decades i mean huge numbers we have i mean i, I 
I th- I think my brain went into kind of burn reading a lot of really nonsense papers and also some papers which made some sense but ultimately when we analyzed all those papers there is a section in that manuscript that we wrote where we look at and specifically discuss on evidence for use of ashwagandha in specific situations so we have uh, anxiety we have stress uh, i mean part of anxiety mental health disorders you use ashwagandha we have uh, for insomnia sleep disorders we have for uh, in some cases they use for muscle health and sexual health and for men and women and so many things so when we looked at all of these we did not find any level 1 or level 2 evidence at all which means good studies done without any bias or really good studies done with very small level of bias that's that's ideally what we should be looking at or for recommending something none of them none of these indications had that and we have made a beautiful table we have made a beautiful chart to very clearly show that what what studies have been done and what are the levels of evidence and what are the recommendations ultimately there are no recommendations because we went and looked at sleep society guidelines we went and looked at endocrine society guidelines none of these societies mention ashwagandha as a use so basically ashwagandha is a supplement which has been promoted by uh, mostly the wellness industry and now uh, also the fitness industry yeah because a lot of uh, people who body build they feel that they get better with it because it's very anecdotal and it's a personal experience yeah. and some of them do land up in trouble so what we know now is that even though there is no good evidence to use ashwagandha for anything depending uh, depending on actual current levels of evidence we are actually getting more patients who are now developing complications because of ashwagandha and uh, the largest series was published uh from the US along with the Iceland uh, drug induced liver injury network team uh and they whatever they have been uh, talking about regarding the type of injury and the and the course of injury we found similar uh in our, among our patients but an additional thing that we found out was that some of the patients who used ashwagandha in our cohort I actually had underlying chronic liver disease so oh, they were wow. not your normal healthy uh, gym going population they did that because chronic liver disease patients have uh, poor sleep they have a sleep reversal they feel more sleep in the morning and they feel less sleep at night it's oh. part of the disease so they have sleep reversal so to control that some of them took ashwagandha and they landed up with severe ashwagandha liver injury leading to liver failure and death in 3 out of 4 wow which is something huge because yeah. there are groups of patients or people where ashwagandha should not be used mm. and there are groups of people generally where ashwagandha has no recommendation for use at all so based on this i mean i i hope this paper will get through the peer review process soon so that uh, i'll be dis- discussing on this at a much uh, better level or a more detailed level no sure this i mean i really look forward i think uh, this is what uh, we want like I mean, as a platform to have these conversations mainstream uh, because you have one side which is taking undue advantage like you said a certain wellness uh, uh, you know uh, industry has sprouted enough which is also uh, you know we know we all are vulnerable right i mean um, uh, marketing is best when you play around with the vulnerability right so yeah. you play around it and people are popping left right center all sort of uh, you know supplements but then there's a downside uh, which i think uh, researchers like you can only find out by empirical evidence to say you know uh, you know it's it outweighs uh, the benefit yeah. right yeah. um all of this also comes to an extent when how you can measure the benefit right and one yeah. uh, recent phenomena uh, which i've started seeing is a, a common person using glucose monitor you know the the cgms the, uh, the continuous yeah. glucose monitors yeah. Yeah. now i know for a fact that it's it's extremely vital for a diabetic person maybe a type 2 type 1 diabetic uh, person but for an average person who doesn't need how important do you think is measuring a glucose spike on a daily basis i mean is there a certain intervention which they can get by having those feedback loop and kind of going back and changing their nutritional choices you know i think these are all just um, over glorified aspects of the wellness industry i don't think anybody needs to do that you know i mean we have technology and the technology is now becoming mutated you know uh, i'm like like we were discussing during our break about gut microbiome and i was discussing in the beginning about stool transplantation where we modulate modify the gut microbiome to improve a health a, a disease condition reduce a disease condition so now there are commercial uh, gut microbiome checking 
uh, platforms where they'll just ask yeah. for your blood or they'll ask for your stool or urine sample and they'll tell you that you know this is high this uh, bacteria is low this bacteria is high so you consume more of that you i mean that there is absolutely no evidence to do something like that absolutely none except you can lose a lot of money <laughs> and the other guys can gain gain your hard earned money and even this glucose spike checking and all comes under that i mean it looks very nice i mean you're if you feel like you're doing something good for your body but ultimately none of those uh, are intervention worthy in the sense that there is no evidence to intervene in, in with those specific uh, findings that you get similar with executive health checkups i think this is one of the most wasteful thing that uh, hospitals offer people there are health checkups that range from 4000 rupees to 50k yeah. and where they'll even uh, let you do an mri just for the fun of yeah. it right i mean why because when you do thousands of things at least one or two things will come up normal in that that doesn't mean that you are a, you are a patient or you are yeah. you are sick so the, this whole aspect of wellness industry i think it's mutated to some forms that we cannot uh, bring it back to but i hope people understand that what they really need and what they really don't and yeah. then take it from there yeah like i said i mean this all connected to the previous conversation where there is a the business of care and there is exactly. a patient care right exactly. so there is a certain business of care which you can't ignore because eventually it gets tied up to the entire stakeholders in the ecosystem whether they genuinely have to do the patient care yeah. and that's where all these diagnoses and you know the technological interventions and all of that comes exactly. right but it's also important uh, i mean i mean on the cgm part i was just thinking that it started up with this phenomena where uh, these professional athletes were using it uh, essentially the elite athletes because they wanted to understand the fueling patterns before a certain race or some yeah, training yeah. but it's less than 0.1% of the population or even less than that right yeah, I, mean, i mean them using it there is a rational behind it right but somebody who's just doing a normal routine workout i mean i don't think that doesn't make sense it. so there is this condition called fever of unknown origin mm. fever of unknown origin which is like one of the most depressing and terrifying conditions that a clinician can face because patient has long term fever for which there is no cause yeah so in that part, that is one of the most heavy duty investigational Uh, situation in clinical medicine so i get a lot of patients with fever of unknown origin so we'll have to do run x rays run cts run mris some of some of them we even have to do bone marrow uh, bone marrow studies to uh, finally find the cause because it can be anything from a simple viral infection to a cancer so in that sense that doesn't become the business of healthcare it becomes actually part of patient care even though it's it's going to be a very expensive procedure throughout but otherwise when you look at these uh, glucose spike machines and gut microbiome evaluation and executive health checkups in an apparently healthy person that becomes the business of healthcare what's and the, that is all to do with wellness industry what's the basic you think uh, an average person who goes 9 to 6 probably uh, you know hoping to live a healthy life should get in terms of a a, a marker Uh, in terms of diagnostics or blood markers, uh, what period it should be, and what should be the basic panels? What they should get done so that they can go back and uh, have a conversation with their physician. So I, I think uh, the whole aspect of health checkups, right? I mean, in an apparently healthy person, uh, depends on what risk factors that per- person has. For example, uh, uh, if you take an example of a guy who's, uh, you know, his his BMI is fine, uh, his uh, he is active. um he is he has no otherwise no comorbidities but his da- father is a diabetic his mother had a stroke or uh, there is a history of a death in the family due to brain disease or something like that uh, it's uh, it, it makes sense for that person to go for a health checkup beyond a particular age where uh, there is chances of these problems manifesting for example uh, we have patients who have history of colon cancers you know, large bowel cancers and uh, their immediate family members uh, require screening you know beyond the age of 30 which is which is which is a rational thing to do um, there might be people who have a uh, history of breast cancers in the family uh, even death due to breast cancers so such women the immediate uh, first degree members can go should go for a mammography and screening like that for cancers uh, beyond that particular age or some of them even go for uh genetic checkups because there are specific genes associated with cancer development breast cancer development in the future so all of this is fine so an apparently healthy person without any of these risk factors where he needs to look into deep i don't think there is any requirement for a health checkup per se unless and until he he has felt uh different from a previous day for example i am i am okay today and uh, a couple of months later i feel 
uh, that my stamina is lesser. I mean, routine things that I'm able to do, I'm not able to do properly now. I'll go for a health checkup. So I think it, it depends on rational decisions uh, based on logical uh, interventions. It's not like I'm feeling lethargic today and I go for an MRI tomorrow. Yeah. Right. It has to be logical interventions. Yeah. And the decisions to go for that particular checkup should be rational. Uh, so, you know, we had a lot of conversations around um, what's wrong, what possibly can be right. Uh, you know, uh, as we try to wrap up, I want to kind of peek into that other side of yours, right? We started the conversation saying that someone who is an avid, um, who wanted to be a screenwriter, uh, wanted to be a graphic novelist, uh, loves the food. Uh, I had a chance to scroll through your um, Instagram page, which is uh, very refreshing and uh, very contrasting other side of who you are probably on, on Twitter or maybe at workplace, right? Uh, pictures filled with food, with family, uh, you know, uh, with your wife, you're traveling, uh, with all of that uh, and the kind of work what you're doing. There are, of course, moments when you are stressed, you are stuck, you are not able to focus. Um, what do you do apart from your coffee? Uh, what's your go-to toolkit when you find yourselves into the situation? And in, in, ex in a way, an extension to that early avatar where you were depressed and you kind of trailed on. I'm sure right now the, we, we discussed that depression is kind of evolving. But in these moments when you are stressed and you don't know what's happening around you, uh, how do you kind of get through and come back to the rails? Um, so basically, the ways that I uh, let loose, I mean, take a break when I get the time to do that. Um, so I have I have some set hobbies which I love to do. Uh, one of them is uh, gaming. So I, I let off a lot of steam uh, with my gaming. I, so I don't have a console. I, I used to be a big console game lover, but when I found out the power of the PC, I stopped looking at console. So I have uh, I have a separate hobby where I with my cousin, I mean, he's now um, in Australia. Uh, so we used to customize uh, machines and build PC machines for 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 gaming purposes. And I've done two such, uh, I mean, three, actually, one for my office and two for my one for my studio and one for my home. So I do a lot of gaming. So I use the Steam engine. I mean, there's a Steam app. And I, I game on the uh, Steam app. I love first-person shooters, which because they are the best and most uh, stress-relieving of all yeah, the lot, of and uh, mostly to do with uh, Nazi zombies. Okay. I love those games. And uh, the second one is to listen to a lot of music. So I have a very uh, broad uh, liking for music. Um, I listen to anything from old evergreen Malayalam songs to. Uh, to BTS songs, which wow. my daughter now hears. I, I love some of the songs there. Wow. So uh, to uh, uh, Bengali songs, to I mean, I love I love a v variety of songs. So it's easy for me to uh, you know get into it. And the third is movies. I mean, there is nothing like a good movie to my help you forget. Yeah. So I recently watched uh, uh, Extraction Two. Oh, okay. I mean, just, Netflix. Yeah. yeah, just put your brains out on the side and just just watch it. And it's so fun. And I loved it. So the, these these are the things that I uh, routinely do to get uh, myself uh, some break from the hectic or the sometimes very, very morbid kind of work that I do on a daily basis. And uh, what something else that I do is that uh, I mean, I'm sure all, all men would agree that the bathroom is the best place to sit and think, right? <laughs> so uh, my wife always shouts at me. I mean, I mean, a bath that you can take in 10 minutes, you're taking 30 minutes for. That's because I sit inside and I, I, I think about the protocols that I can make in the future for my studies, right? So I have, uh, so this, this Ashwagandha protocol all, all came out from the bathroom. <laughs> I was sitting and I was thinking about what is a, what, how to approach this problem how to collect the data, how to how to make a performer. All of this comes with when you're alone and there is nothing around. So thinking more about my patients and what they what can be done for them from a different angle, may, whether it be a treatment or a research protocol or something novel, uh, I think even that calms me down a lot. Do you, on that note, I mean, do you school people on Twitter sitting uh, when you're in the bathroom? Not much, <laughs> because I use that uh, time to read a lot of 
<laughs> a lot of stuff. news yeah right. yeah a lot of news i browse through a lot of news and articles and right. i catch up on some newly published data i read just i read some abstracts and i yeah. follow some scientists so i yeah. I, i i do that for them what do you think is your superpower today i the my superpower is that i don't have a superpower right the fact that i have, don't have any superpowers and i'm just an ordinary guy uh who strives every day to do extraordinary things for others uh, i think maybe that's that's good enough superpower for me uh what is what is the one um uh you know one uh, habit what you had incorporated in in your life uh, in the recent past which kind of have changed the trajectory of your outlook towards your life yeah so yeah there is one um so this was about um, a couple of years back exactly on diwali day in 2021 when i crashed my car so i i used to drive myself um i used to come late from hospitals because uh, the place that i work uh, it's um, it's about 1 to 1 and a half hours away from where i stay so i stay at kochi and this place is at alwa uh, so i come back late night and at somewhere around 7 7:15 i was driving through this long strip of road where there are no street lights there was a huge trailer truck parked on the left side and i was driving on the left side and i did not see the truck in front of me because there were no reflectors i could not see the reflectors and i was thinking about my patients who were admitted that evening and i was in that thought it's my fault uh, i was not concentrating on the road and i went full speed 60 kilometers per hour straight into the back of the truck i went straight in all the way in and uh, i was so zonked i mean some miracle nothing happened to me except for some scratches bruises and a, a 12th rib fracture little my small fracture hairline and i got on the car totally confused and i was sitting on the curb side and i can see a lot of people rushing in and looking inside the car and i'm telling these guys you know guys i am the guy sitting inside and they were not believing me because they thought there is a dead body inside because my car was smashed that bad that day i decided that you know it was life changing for me because i should have died that day easily i should have died and uh, i did not and uh, that day I decided that so many things need to change so the first change i did was uh, to convert my work hours from monday to friday and not work on a saturday and sunday saturday sunday i just don't care about anything else except for maybe i have to do some clinical research project discussion or maybe shoot a podcast like this or discuss something else other than hospital work and patients i don't do anything on weekends so i changed that life pattern when i uh, to to some to another pattern where i can spend more time with my family because i i found out that you know ultimately uh, i mean towards end of your time uh, the memories matter right so uh, there is this uh, there is this movie called a river runs through it I'm not sure the new generation has seen it yeah. but I I urge everybody to see it. Uh it's it's by Robert Redford and I think it's one of the I've seen it yeah. Uh, it's it's so hard hitting. Yeah. And uh, in the poster they mentioned that nothing perfect lasts forever yeah. except in your memory. Yeah. So the whole point is to make more memories, yeah. right? And uh, that's with family. And I decided that this is the change that I need immediately. So after that life changing event this is one thing i incorporated into my life that is to spend more time with family because of which my mental health has improved hugely hugely there is no denying it so if i have to ask you what's your go to toolkit for your mental health would that be leaning on on your family or is there something beyond it no it's it's spending time with family so i mean it's not like you have to take them out and go on a trip or anything it's just being there you know i mean yeah. they'll be playing somewhere in yeah. other room they'll be playing around you they'll be watching tv but just the fact that they are around you yeah. they are there my 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 wife might be uh, uh, arranging something or doing something or talking to somebody on the phone but they are there and yeah. i am there with them yeah. so that that feeling itself is so therapeutic yeah uh, so uh, passion outside medicine is essentially gaming right yes right? and movies and movies i would put movies first oh really okay yeah. and uh, <clears throat> and is that again the fascination from bringing that because you wanted to be a screenwriter you were hooked to I movie think so, I so, think so so your lens of i would assume your choices of music but movie would be uh, probably in a uh, different from usual people right because you're looking from a different lens i i see i mean i have no boundaries for movies right so i see korean violent dramas 
uh, to chick flicks which make others around me cry but not me mm. and i i see a lot of such movies so there are no limits to the movies that i can watch but one movie that really hit me when i was probably i think i was in 10th or 9th at that time was uh, or maybe 11th i think it was a movie called cinema paradiso i'm not sure i mean people should see that movie i have not seen a life changing movie like that ever and i fell in love with the movies because that was the first time a movie was actually affecting me so i knew that movies are so powerful so influential in that manner i started seeing a lot of different types of movies so movies are number one i mean it's i mean it's so good the, about cinema what is your number one long running frustration outside the pseudo science quackery and misinformation uh, outside that is there something which is frustrating you for a long time now yeah i mean i missed out a lot on my ch- 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 children growing up okay. so i have three children uh, the eldest is 10 going to be 10 the second i mean two are daughters and a younger son um second uh, is about 6 and the third my younger son is about 4 so because i made this change uh, in the last 2 3 years i was able to spend more time with my son but when i look back i actually missed a lot of that with my eldest daughter because i was at the time studying and i was very busy with all that work and my second daughter also i was i just came back to kochi and i was you know getting myself into the game of you know clinical practice and that is one regret that i always have because it would have been really nice if if i could live that again yeah uh hike on the mountains or walk on the beach walk on the beach uh if you have to go if you have to go back and uh get a meal with someone from your past uh probably living or non living um uh, who would that be and uh, what would you want to have a meal a meal with someone who is from your from your past could be living or non living who would that person somebody be somebody that i already know yes someone from your past uh who would that be uh because you i mean academic career uh, you know your practice so so much uh, why I, i would choose my grandmother interesting yeah uh, and what meal would you ha- like to have with her i would have the the routine kerala meal where there is a fish curry meal right yeah yeah uh, i mean i i still remember i used to visit my ancestral home uh and they used to serve the best chicken fry and and fish at that time uh with your routine rice i mean nothing nothing majestic it's just some chutney little bit of vegetable very very tasteful uh we call it more i'm not sure it's it's a kind of yes. spiced buttermilk yeah. yeah and i i have never had that taste uh, ever yeah so i would i would go i would want to go back to that time because uh i really miss those days because you see the the, the time that even my children are at now it's so complicated i yeah. mean <clears throat> it's it's all about digitized kind of uh memories right but yeah. at that time it was raw real yeah. unmixed kind of memories that uh, i we used to have we used to go walk into our small plantation uh, break cocoa fruits and have that cocoa i mean you don't get to do that now i don't i don't even know if cocoa fruits exists now i mean they they used to sell it off for coffee making and all that but uh, that 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 kind of a feeling i get uh when i have a meal with my grandmother No, yeah, I mean, I, I was I, I probably assuming you probably will say, uh, I think in Kerala what they call paraganji, right? I mean, yeah, the, yeah, what I mean, you it's, have it's, 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 previous yeah, night yeah, and then yeah. you squeeze a little your uh, mango pickle and exactly, you put a lot of yeah. curd. That's like your uh, classic uh, breakfast for the champions. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure, uh, uh, Dr. Abby, and um, I call you Doc because uh, uh, all through this time we've been texting you, uh, you know, saying Doc. uh no i th- the idea when i reached out to you to have this conversation was to have my general curiosity about who you are outside of uh, that social identity of yours uh, i mean there is a certain persona what uh, people have about you uh, which they see but beyond that uh, there is a reason why you are and that's what we try to i mean that was my curiosity to understand uh, why you became that and i hope that's what uh, we i mean we were able to cover up and the cue for people was to a uh, you know don't take health for granted and more importantly uh, you know uh, your health is your health uh, right i mean you have to define your guardrails and protocols and uh, you have to be very mindful in seeing whose advice and whose recommendation you instill 
but as a you know as we wrap it up uh, your twitter feed is kind of swarmed with recommendations and suggestions and opinions so if i have to ask you which is the most common question you will uh, you are i am sure there is nothing common because i think hundreds of people are asking about what supplement should i take or should i drink that should i sleep like that sure. but if there's one thing which you have to tell uh, you know folks who are listening and watching uh, what's the most first principle what they can do about their health what that could be um i would i would suggest i mean my first ad, my advice would would be that uh always uh take care of yourself the the way you would take care of uh, i mean always take care of yourself the way would the, the way you would take care of a family for example uh, so i mean this is i mean to simplify it uh see i mean if you are not healthy you are not going to be healthy for i mean you are not going to be of much uh, goodness to people around you so ultimately your whole the the whole aspect of your presence is to be of servitude to others around you your family your friends so you need to understand that uh, health is not a simple game you know it's not like it's it's from one point to another point it's a very complex situation and you should not take your own health granted and follow your own set of rules for it there are people around you who can guide you so find the right person to speak to a person a stranger like me sitting on uh, a social media is not that right person right you have to have a realistic conversation with a real person in front of you so if you have any general or complex queries on health or whether to use a particular supplement or whether to uh, include a particular diet pattern or whether to go for a particular checkup please meet with a doctor who will speak with you face to face and discuss things with you and if you cannot find that uh strive to find it you know it's easy i mean it, it, i mean i get a lot of questions people just randomly send me all their blood reports and everything on dms and it's not easy for me to answer any of them and i don't answer any of them because it's it's no i i they're not uh, getting what they deserve from uh, from doing that so my first uh, advice would be to please talk with your speak with your doctor do not depend on any doctor who is on the social media for your health needs including me uh, because the right way to health is to first understand that you have to meet the right person who will advise you about healthcare yeah. and uh, there are no shortcuts to it yeah no thank you very much i i'm, I'm sure uh, people already know you on uh, twitter so I, i'm going to uh, list all that in show uh, in the show notes but uh, any other way pe- you think people should follow your work uh, any other platform you would like to direct people to uh, so I, i mean i'm i'm mostly active on twitter yeah. uh, i'm also now active on instagram at the same handle at the liver dr the liver doctor uh, where i put up short videos and uh, uh, on Uh, simplified aspects on healthcare for example i i mostly deal with liver health there yeah. uh, no controversy is there it's all plain simple uh, videos and uh, it's 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 mostly educational yeah. and i have a youtube channel which is okay. currently now defunct but okay. i will bring it up again the last time i made a video was probably around 3 3 and a half months back okay. but i'm going to use that uh, as a long form uh, video for maybe like a couple of one or two videos long form on a particular uh, important topic every yeah. month and also use it as a uh, as a doctor live session so that's going to start maybe probably in a couple of months i am preparing the studio for that okay. so we'll have a doctor live session where you can directly talk with me speak to me regarding so it's it's better than you know sending me yeah. your reports and everything on yeah. uh, on uh, on uh, dm yeah. uh, you can directly speak face to face on the doctor live session so that i'm planning sometime in the future so that's that's on my youtube channel oh, brilliant so i'm going to uh, add the links to your youtube channel uh, your instagram channel twitter everyone knows uh you're out there um uh, thank you for taking this time i mean, i had a, a you know a very interesting and a, a brilliant time uh, unpacking uh, that other side of yours uh and i and i really really hope that um uh you know the scientific temperament uh, that ability for people to appreciate nuanced aspect of their life uh, their health um kind of the level increases uh, as we as we 
you know get into the new generation and i want to have a follow up conversation with you maybe in some times i know some very interesting projects you are working on i don't yeah. want to spill the beans so uh, keep an eye on your twitter thread uh, beyond um, all the revelations what you're doing some very other interesting projects you're working on so i'll keep that excitement for you to yeah. uh, uh, announce that on your twitter thread but thank you once again for taking the time uh, talking to me um, had a great time yeah, thank you for uh, having me on the show and it was my pleasure and i think we spoke a lot about uh, non routine things which i i absolutely loved and i hope uh, the the people who watch this uh, gains uh, a good out of it yeah sure yeah, thank you thank you once again see you soon then thank you thank you that was the end of the podcast i had a great time talking to dr ab for sharing his experiences with us i hope you got some takeaways to go out and explore your other side it would mean a lot to me to get your feedback You can leave a comment on YouTube or reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. And do not forget to subscribe to the channel. Share it with your friends or family members. I'll see you next time with another new guest exploring the other side. See you.